Listen, gang, I just came here to tell you that um, this is not an easy conversation to listen to. It's actually a very difficult conversation to listen to. Um, there's a lot of talk on abuse. It is easily the most... It's easily the most powerful and upsetting conversation we've ever had on this podcast. Like, there's another one that springs to mind, but this was definitely something very different. Um, Shamza is a FGM survivor and she goes into a lot of detail about her story. So I just want to let you know that there will be some things that might be very, very difficult for you to listen to. But I think it's a very important conversation to be had. You would be taught, oh, you still have your clitoris. Yeah. Like the girl with the clitoris. Why are you still walking around with your clitoris? And because we were being tormented by someone who knew us or we were going to go, you know, fetch water from the well, no matter what we did, you would hear comments like that. And if a girl reached a certain age and she still had a clitoris, nobody in that village would respect her. All right, how is everyone doing? I hope everyone is good. I have a very special guest with me today. A very special guest. You know, like, I, at the beginning of the year, some of you lot would have heard me say that, like, I just want to just have some different conversations. I want to just explore my curiosity a lot. Um, I want to have some people in here just to, like, tell some of their stories. I want to learn things. I'm still trying to learn some stuff. I'm still trying to... I feel like I'm still trying to polish my my belief system. I'm trying to confirm and polish. Do you get what I'm saying? I get it. Um, and and by doing that, I think it's really important to have all different types of conversations. And I have someone called Shamza here with me today. How are you? I'm great, thank you. In a nutshell, actually, could you let my gang know, like, what is it that you do today? Like, what do you do today? Ooh, I do a lot. I am a educator. I am a social activist and I have now become someone who rescues um, boys and girls from honor-based violence. Mad. <laughs> and I'm sure that it's going to make a lot of sense as we start like going through elements of the story. Firstly, how are you feeling? You all right? You good? I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm good. Everything all right? I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm traveled, over the mood. Traveled all right and stuff? Travel was, was good. Yeah. I had a little minor step back when I got to the station because my a phone decided hiccup. to just a little hiccup but um McDonald's solved that so McDonald's solved yeah. that yeah. right then yeah. what did you get by the way just before we keep moving what, what did you get what I you for? got a strawberry milkshake okay honorable shout out to them better. for even having milkshakes because more time when I go for a milkshake they, <laughs> they don't have, have it yeah exactly. I was quite surprised right I was proud as well and anything else what you didn't go for no. young chips no, I don't like the saga chips. Oh, no. Discipline. Let me tell you something. McDonald's isn't my thing thingy, but anytime I, I can't like chips is my biggest weakness in life. I always I order chips with every. Let me, <laughs> in fact, <laughs> I could go to a, like a nice restaurant or whatever, yeah, and just like order like you know a nice plate of food or whatever. Yeah. But if there's a side of chips there, you want the side of chips. I need a young side of chips. Do you mm. get what I'm saying? My daughter's like that. Is it? I'm not a big fan of chips, <laughs> unfortunately. But my daughter, oh, she, she loves it, absolutely. She has to have chips with everything. I swear. And mayo. And mayo. Yeah, mayo, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm new to the mayo game. I can't lie. It was more tomato done. Me too. Got a young, yeah, little young barbecue sauce and that. But I've kind of got into the mayo thing. Yeah, and a little garlic mayo in that as oh, well. I like garlic mayo. Yeah, the necessary needs Touches to occur. Spot. Mm. Mm. <laughs> All right. Are you make, talking about foods making me hungry. <laughs> All right. So, okay. Someone actually messaged me and said to me, you know what? Um, she's actually sick because she referred someone else to me. I can't even remember who it was. And that episode's not even out yet. But anyway, she was like, oh, you know what? This person, like, they've, like, gone through X, Y, and Z. Should have a conversation with them. And I had them on the pod and, and spoke, to that, spoke to that person. And then, I think it was Javino, yeah. by the way. And then um, she came back, like, quite recently. And she mm. was like, you know what? I think I've got someone else for you. 
And I was like, who? And then she sent me you. Yes. And she was like, um, you should have a conversation about FGM. And then I had a little look and I sent you to my researcher, Sheila, honorable shout out to her. And like, she was very happy to know that we were gonna, that like this was a possible conversation or whatnot. So we made it happen. I'm glad. And so the first question I wanna ask you is, what is FGM? <coughs> So FGM stands for female genital mutilation and it there are four types. So type one is the partial or full removal of the clitoris. And in some cases they sew um, the top. Um, there's type two, which is the removal, part removal or the full removal of the clitoris and the libia minora. Um, and again, in some cases, depending on the community and the ethnic background and the country, they also tend to sew. Um, then there's type three, the type I had, is the partial or full removal of the clitoris, the libia and the libia majora, which is the larger outer lips. Um, and they sew you together, leaving a small hole for urination and um, another one for future penetration mm -hmm. or period flow, um, which is <laughs> neither are impossible because mm. the, the holes that they leave are so tiny. Yeah. Um, and type four is anything that causes deliberate um, change to the female genitalia. So piercing, pricking, burning, uh, scratching, scraping, all of that comes under type four. And it can happen to girls from the ages of zero all the way up to, they say, <sighs> teenage years. But in my personal opinion and research shows that it can go up to 20, 21. Zero? Zero, yeah. So basically, like... When the child is born. What? Like, okay, why? <laughs> There are many re different reasons they use. So uh, purity is a big one to m ensure the girl stays pure. And I don't know how they came up with, you know, purity and cutting off pieces of, of girl, a little girl's genitalia. Um, I, another reason is they use it. They say that it's a rite of passage, mm. you know, to, to womanhood. Um, and other reasons could be religious, um, to make the woman marryable, because men were saying, we're not gonna marry a woman who's not cut. Right. In their opinion, the clitoris is seen as something unnecessary, something that's dirty. It's high, like, it just increases the woman's sexual drive and we can't control ourselves. So they kind of dim it down in, right, their, right. in their view. Okay, what, what is like, what is the obsession with purity? Like, w w like, where does that come from? Honestly, I think it comes from the centuries that women have been oppressed and tried to be kept in line and controlled. Um, and for them, it's, you know, m ensuring that the girl doesn't have sex before marriage, mm. for example. Um, from my personal opinion, the way that I view it being a survivor is they think that we're all hoes <laughs> and yeah. sluts and we're going to grow up to be that way. Um, so it's like a preventative and other cultures, they also use it as a, to prevent rape mm -hmm. and sexual assault. But how are you going to subject your child to that type of trauma because you don't want them to get raped as if that's going to stop yeah anything. because ultimately like if someone's going to rape someone they will they're, gonna, they're going to do it regardless mm -hmm. yeah it's it's i think the purity aspect of things is like quite interesting to me anyway because i'm always curious to understand like why that became so important and what happened. I mean, maybe no, nobody really knows. It's like, you know, is there a story of like, you know, someone somewhere 
at a time where there maybe wasn't the population wasn't so big and there was one person who was deemed as like super rebellious and so from that aspect they was like you know what we are going to stop anyone from potentially being this way it's almost like it might be a little bit different but go with me here yeah it's almost like you know when you had where people had slaves yeah right and then you might have had that one uh, runaway slave so what you do is you treat everyone or well, you like use this away, person yeah. as an example mm. and so and you do a madness to them and then on top of that you treat people a certain type of way to implement the fear yeah. of them like if you think about ever leaving this is so deeply in your mind you're yes, never going to do it do you understand what i'm it, yeah. saying 100 percent. i i agree i think there is some element um of that when they started this but what was really interesting is fgm wasn't done on living beings it was actually done on dead mummies um it started it's said to be originated um from egypt it was found on mummies and then they started because egypt had a lot of um slaves um at the time of the pharaohs and they thought, oh, okay, this is a great way to keep, make, ensure that the slave women weren't having sex. You know, there wasn't to lessen the risk of them getting raped so that they can sell for a higher price. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then gradually every country that traded with Egypt took that tradition back home and did it on their girls, um, wives, future wives. They just had this expectation, especially the men in the community, um, that this is the way to control women and mm. their sexual desires. And I think it comes from the lack of education about female genitalia, because it, when a man is telling you about her, you know, what shouldn't or shouldn't be there, it just shows l lack of education. Like mm. You don't know the functions of any of these organs, but yet you deemed it unnecessary. Mm. Um, which is baffling to me because one man said, you know, women just squirt at water, you know, and you need to, we need to stop that. And I'm thinking, what the fuck are you talking about? Since when are we walking out here squirting? That's crazy. <laughs> you know, yeah, just that is constantly crazy. wet. Like that, that's not how it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they also believe that women can easily be deceived um or tricked into having sex but we're not we're not dumb mm. if a woman wanted to have sex fgm or not she will have sex mm. there are women who have been closed shut have been sewn together and they still have sex yeah yeah so what happens when like women rise up a little bit and is like because if this is happening or you find that this happens between um, young girls of like zero to p potentially 21 you obviously the people that survive it and like you know maybe don't die through childbirth or maybe even just through other situations and circumstances in life get a little bit older like what happens when women that are older rise up a little bit and is like hold on wait one second is this even mm. like is this right like we shouldn't even really be what happens nothing absolutely nothing the most heartbreaking thing is majority of these women have been conditioned to think that this is okay especially the older generation and the younger generation majority of them don't even know that what happened to them is a crime they are oblivious they have been told that this is culture this is the way that uh, we do things and especially for the younger generation, they're trying to protect their parents. They're trying to protect the people that did this to them. On top of that, we're dealing with the insecurities, the physical compl uh, complications, as well as the psychological complications. Um, so there are a handful of women that are speaking out against it, but the rest who are still living within those communities will not utter a word because they will be shamed. They will be bullied. Um, and no, it's, it's very, very difficult practice to stand up against, especially if you're a victim against it. 
uh, if you're a victim of it, I mean, um, simply because you're afraid of the whole entire community mm. coming at you. Um, for example, now my community, the way that I'm described is the woman that talks about vaginas to white people. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm sorry, but this af doesn't affect white people as much as it affects mm. um, the black community. Right. You know, and it's really sad that we're not making a massive deal out of this. Mm. Like, it, it's shocking to me. And, you know, we have this, there are some Africans who've said to me, or, you know, why are you painting, why are you making it seem like it's the whole of Africa? You know, you need to be specific with these countries. I'm not going to be fucking specific because it, it exists, if it exists in one country in Africa, then we as Africans have an issue. Right. Because why are we allowing our girls to be cut? These are black girls, young, beautiful black girls that are going to grow up with so much complications and their f husbands don't know what to do. They're not they don't really care because they can't understand they mm. can't sympathize you know they have never heard the severity of our situation and what we are actually dealing with and it's because of people like myself and other social activists that are shining a light on it and only um like most recently more survivors are coming out and speaking out against it but it's not enough mm. you know it's not enough to stop this practice we need more we need to start changing social norms if the whole entire community thinks this is normal and one person thinks this isn't right what changes is, is going to happen there nothing mm. you know um so we need education <laughs> and this is why i do what i do because most of them like i said i met a was a 24 year old woman she messaged me and she said until I watched your video, I didn't know what happened to me was a crime. Do you know, do you know what? It, it, like, there's, I remember one time, right? Um, I was, I was at a festival and these two um, ladies came up to me and they was like, they watched the podcast or whatever. And it was like, oh, you know, like, I want to have a deep conversation. Let's have a deep conversation now. <laughs> Obviously, that time wasn't the right time to have a deep conversation. But I just said to them, okay, cool. Quickly, what is right and what is wrong? So then they was trying to explain to me what was right and what was wrong. And I was just kind of like, you know, kind of just running rings around them a little bit just to make them really think about mm. what they were saying. Yeah? Because yeah. sometimes, like, which I say all the time, is that there are certain things that maybe that we look at now and we say is like wholeheartedly wrong. But yeah. at one point, it was just so right, and at, and at one and there's going to be a time where maybe in a hundred years time or even a thousand years time, they're going to look back today and be like, "What these lot were drinking cow's milk? That's insane!" You know, like things yeah. like that. Like yeah, yeah. you know, like it just changes all of the time. And like to bring it into this, it's like it does, It brings up something quite interesting because for, if this has been going on for such a long time, and that is part of like culture, you wouldn't. You don't, you wouldn't know that that is wrong because you would just feel like, well, this is just something that everyone, it's just normal. It's just, it's normal. Yes, absolutely. I genuinely thought it was normal. Absolutely, full heartedly thought it was normal until I came to this country and I learned that actually what happened to me wasn't just a crime, but my parents hmm. and my relatives, it wasn't my mother and father, but it was my grandma um, chose this for me. And it was as if, because I didn't have that conversation with my mom about it, it was, we are never allowed to have a conversation about FGM hmm. in our households, in our communities. It's a woman's issue. You're supposed to keep it a secret. You're supposed to keep it to yourself. You know, even having a period. I was told to keep it to myself, even though I, I thought I was dying. You know, I genuinely thought I was dying. And because there was no explanation beforehand mm -hmm. that, you know, this might happen. This is how you deal with it. This is the solution. It, I didn't get any of that. But when I did get my period, I was told, shh, don't mm -hmm. tell your dad. Don't tell your brothers. Don't tell your sister. Don't tell your teacher. Nobody can know. Mm -hmm. So 
FGM is, is similar to that. It's not something that women are allowed to talk about. Yeah. Even if it's causing them pain um, and they have worries about sex or pregnancy or labor, they are still told just keep silent, keep quiet, yeah, exactly. you know, and don't complain. And it's like, but why? Why am I not allowed to complain? You've caused this pain, this com discomfort. You've caused PTSD. You've caused my anxiety, my depression. Um, and I'm not allowed to talk about it. So there are over 200 million women that have been affected by this and growing. That is an insane amount of people. That is an insane that's, amount. That's, that's like, that's, that's a crazy amount of people. That is, yeah. It's like a country. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I think the number has risen quite a lot, but they have gotten so good at hiding it. Now that it's a crime in most countries, they've got a really good at hiding it. Let's talk about your story. Help paint the picture of your childhood. Where did you grow up? I grew up in a small village in Somalia. Um, majority of the village was relatives and family members. Um, there was hardly anyone who was not a family member because it was so small and so tight knit. Everyone knew everybody. Um, everyone was raised with everybody's child. I had been raised with 12, we were all together with we 12 siblings, cousins. Um, it was m myself, my sister, and my other little sister who unfortunately passed away um, whilst we were there. So it was just me and my sister. Um, and a bunch of cousins and i remember we used to herd sheep and cows and um goats and we used to milk them as well and i used to enjoy it we used to go collect water and you know carry it i was i was really young and i started doing these chores when i was five mm. we used to farm um as well um you know dig the holes and put the thing in and it was just it was a lot, but we found it so much fun. Mm. We I don't know why, but when you have nothing else to do and you're in such an open space, that is fun for children. That was fun for us anyway. And we had each other, you know? Um, and because the community was so small, every single woman was cut. And we used to know, uh, we used to call it guditan, which translates to female circumcision. Right. And I remember one day, because we knew that this is something that we were eventually going to get done, we've heard it over and over and over again since, you know, we were really young. And even the girls who had it done before us would come and say, oh my God, it was amazing. You know, you, you, you're gonna become a woman. It's nothing to be afraid of. Bitch, you fucking liar. And in my mind, I'm thinking, how? could you go through something like that and advertise it in a way like you're getting your ears pierced and we were so excited like i can't i can't even do you think, explain. Do you think in hindsight looking back at it that like there was an element of uh, like a coping mechanism yes like feeling like the in order for me to be able to deal with this i have to be able to i have to feel like it's for these reasons for me to be able to cope with it a hundred percent. We thought we were, it w the whole entire point of it was to be accepted by your community. Because I got it done when I was six, my sister was seven and my cousin was five. So it was literally seven, six and five. And because we, my sister had it a little bit later and I, I guess you can say me too, you would be told, oh, you still have your clitoris. Yeah. Like the girl with the clitoris. Why are you still walking around with your clitoris? And because we were being tormented, whether we went to the duksi that we were learning Quran from, we were walking by someone who knew us, or we were going to go, you know, fetch water from the well. No matter what we did, you would hear comments like that. And if a girl reached a certain age and she still had a clitoris, nobody in that village would respect her. No man would marry her. So part of the reason why they do it is so that their daughters can get married so that they are able to get money for their daughters. 
um, money that is meant for the daughters, but the parents take, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I remember my grandma came and she said, you know, you're gonna have your good turn. And we were like, oh my God, it's our turn. You know, we're not gonna um, be called the girl with the clitorises anymore. And we went willingly to my grandma's house. We lived at uh, the house that uh, we built using cow poo. <laughs> amazing story you what you built a house yeah <laughs> I, yeah we actually did we were using cow poo yes that so we nuts. what do you mean so the house was made it wasn't made out of bricks it was yeah. made out of sticks okay so we would the adults would like make the foundation of the right. house right. and then it was us kids who had to go collect cow poo and then mix it with um sand right and plaster it's wow. on the house, <laughs> on the house. Wow. So uh, that is an amazing accomplishment for a six year old. That is, it, that's amazing. But you know what? Wait, mushrooms grow out of cow poo in that as well, isn't it? We did not yeah. see. Hey, hey. <laughs> we did a conversation on mushrooms as well not long ago. Hey, the cow poo seems to be mad valuable out here. Mad. Uh, to I'm be honest, the first time I saw mushrooms here in the UK, yeah. I was disgusted. I could imagine. The reason why is it was I didn't know that cow poo produced uh, or helped grow uh, mushrooms, but donkey yeah. was it? I don't know whether it was their urine or their p um, poo, but wherever a urine took a shit or a, a donkey took a shit or um, peed, a mushroom would grow. So in our mind, I'm like, why are you guys eating this? Yeah. It's disgusting. These times you're seeing it next like, to a plate uh, of like chicken and whatever. You're, you're like, what's going on? When I came to this country, <laughs> I was judging. You must have been so baffed. Oh my God, I was judging. Yeah. I was judging. Yeah. But um, we were taken from the house that we built to my grandma's house. And I remember because the way that our houses are built is a bit different. So we have the house and then we have a massive front yard. Um, it's just an open space really. And then you have the gate, like the massive gates on the outside. We don't have like a backyard. Um, so this, there was, as soon as we came in, there was a strange woman who was sat down and there was a little chair made out of um, skin, animal skin, I forgot what uh, animal skin it was, but it, they're very, very like, short like almost ground ground level and i remember again being so excited and seeing what it was and you know being respected as soon as i finished and being told that you did amazing and we were all very you know excited and giggly and laughing and they told my little cousin the five-year-old because they said, who wants to go first? I was like, ah. Even though I was six, I was really, really, really smart. And I knew that I was not going to be the first. I knew that I had to see what it was mm, first, first yeah. before I could be like, okay, yeah, I wanna do it too. So my cousin skipped, like literally happy skipped to that chair. And the moment she sat down, my grandma, my my two aunties uh, and my uncles, each adult grabbed a limb. And it was so fast and so violent that me and my sister literally looked at each other and then looked back and we thought, okay, maybe, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe, you know, but everything was happening so fast. And then even the girl, the five-year-old was so confused as to what was happening and why her, relatives were grabbing onto her limbs and trying to keep her down and then we they spread her legs open and i didn't see the razor is a double-sided razor they used i didn't see the razor because the woman was a little bit further up so i didn't know what she was using the first thing i heard was my cousin's screaming and when she screamed, we thought, what? We're like, what is going on? And then we saw the blood. And then we saw, you know, her being cut. And again, me and my, me and my sister looked at each other and we got up and we ran in opposite directions. Cause we were like, fuck no. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I don't not me, that. not yeah. today, no, no. I would rather keep, I would rather be disrespected than have that done to me. So we ran. 
And again, we didn't know because we didn't stay to watch the the full cutting. We didn't know what was being cut. We just knew it was down there, but we didn't know the severity of the situation. Um, unfortunately, because we are very young and everyone knows everyone, we were brought back by my uncle. He ran after us. Um, we were brought back and when we got back, um, my cousin was being sewn, like, like physically sewn together. She, uh, they put a cloth in her mouth, so you know, to stop her from screaming, or to lessen the screams. And when they finished, they tied her legs together, and picked her up and put her down on the floor. I said, next. Oh my god. And I was like, no, 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 and. My someone came, I don't remember who, and I was dragged to the seat that my cousin was just bled on. And I can't even imagine the amount of diseases I could have caught, or she could have caught, you know, I don't know if this same razor was used before she even came, you know, because they don't have that much money. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not even that much money to, to get a girl um, cut. Mm -hmm. So I was dragged to the um, chair. And again, my family members held every limb they could. And because I was a fighter at the time, um, I refused to put my bottom down on the, on the chair. I just, I really did not want to sit down on it. Um, because I knew if I sit, like if I sat still, then she would cut more you know and so i tried to move as much as i could but because i'm a six-year-old and mm. i have five adults holding me down it's pretty much impossible 100. um to fight them and then i felt the blade hit my skin bear in mind there was no anesthetic involved there was no painkillers involved there was no nothing was sterile everything was just dirty and it was the same razor again that was just used on my cousin, not a new one. So she would like pick at the, the skin and she would just, it's, it's like slicing off um, beef or ham, you know, just like, it's, it's, it's disgusting. And this, I, then I, I, because I felt the pain, I was screaming, I was pleading, please stop, please mm -hmm. stop. You know, why are you doing this to me? Because we couldn't understand why. There was never an explanation. We weren't told that this was what Guditan was. And I remember at, what, at some point, my body went into shock. Uh, they cut my clitoris, they cut my Libia, and they cut my Libia Majora. So pretty much everything was gone. And then, I, my body went into shock and I think it, I went kind of numb for a little bit and I turned to the side and the, there was a jar next to this woman and it was half full and this is what I mean when I say maybe she came right after doing a few other girls because like the jar was full and what I know now is it's the pieces that they cut off and so it's just bleeding and it's just and in my, in my, I'm like, I was as a child, I was still trying to figure out what that is. You're still trying to process it. I'm still trying to process everything, yeah. you know? And then came the sewing. And to say that it is one of the most horrible feeling, which is undescribable, to be honest with you. I can't describe it. There's no way I can describe it. To have a needle go in and then out mm. and then in and out on the same wound that was just cut, by mm. the way. You know, they're not sewing and you know something that has healed. They're sewing what they've just cut. Mm. Um, and they sewed me completely shut, leaving a tiny hole for urination and again a small hole for penetration. And then once I was done, my legs were tied together to keep the stitches in place because if I had ripped the so stitches, ripped them, yeah. I would have had it to redone yeah, the same yeah, day. Yeah. Um, the same day. The same day, yeah. And um, they put me aside right next to my cousin and we were in so much pain and we were in so much shock and even then, we had to then watch my sister sit on the same chair and have hers done. 
And when my sister was done, I think the shock kind of, like, because you, you get over shit pretty fast. Because if you don't, th there's no other choice. Nobody's apologizing. Nobody's being sympathetic. Nobody's being empathetic. Nobody gives a fuck. So it's like, get over it, you know? Um, and you are told that. You're told to get over it. Stop crying. Um, as a child, as a six, seven, and five-year-old. Um, and once my sister was done, she was also, had her legs tied together. She, she was uh, sat next to us. And then, please tell me why my buddy decided, oh, Shop says it's a great time to pee. Um, oh my God. On, like, yeah, I, I, yeah. yo, listen, you're, the uh, you're, burning. I'm, yeah, of course. The stinging. It was like someone had a knife and it was stabbing you. And the funny thing is, urination is supposed to be natural, right? It's yeah. supposed to take minutes for it to all come out. This shit was taking like 30 minutes, mm -hmm. like 20 to 30 minutes. Like it was drop, drip, 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 mm. drip. And the pain was just, it felt like it was never ending. It, it, just, it was just continuous. And I remember having um my grandma and uncle and aunties slaughtered an animal and they drained the blood they put it in like a bucket and they washed us in the animal blood and we had to stand there as children and i asked my auntie um a few weeks ago why the fuck they did that and they said and she said because you guys had a really high fever um after being cut and the only way they resolved it was putting animal blood on us to like calm the shock or like lower the fever because they were very superstitious about shit like that. <laughs> and I'm like, so you thought slaughtering an animal and putting its blood on us helped? And they're like, yeah, because the, we didn't have medicine, we didn't have anything. So why the fuck are you cutting girls then? Mm. Because can you imagine the amount of girls that bled to death because of this? There are many, millions of girls bled out. Either bled out or um, they had, like, the, um, the urine had nowhere to come out. So it accumulated inside of, of them. Of course, and then that's massively And it causes, um, that, could, that in itself can cause um, a little girl to die. Um, and then they washed the blood off us um and we weren't allowed to walk for a very long time a few weeks um we had to be carried to the toilet and carried back um and i remember when we were allowed to walk we weren't allowed to run we were ha we had to walk very slow um we couldn't do kids stuff even though we really wanted to um and we had to allow the stitches to at least come out and the skin can heal shut um my cousin because like i said i was six my sister was seven we were a little bit smarter i guess um than she was because she was a child so was i but she was a lot younger than us and she didn't know we could they couldn't keep her to like keep still like stop running so her stitches came off and they restitched her the same day like I think it was like, I don't know, a week later, her stitches came off, like literally like opened and they shut her back. They closed her back up. Um, and so we knew to not mess around with our stitches. Otherwise, we will have to go through that again. So we, we had to be very, very careful. And after a few months, we were told that our mother was coming to get us and we didn't meet after our a few mom. months for a few months yeah oh, so, so they once the stitches come out it takes a few like a good six three to six months to heal so just, just for clarity then so when you go off to do this you're sent away from your parents for a period of time i lived with my grandma okay. i never met my mom uh i she gave birth to us and she was working to get us here to this country so she was working as a maid in Saudi. Oh, she was Saudi. living here? Oh, where, no. sorry? She was, uh, she was a maid in Saudi. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And my father was here. Um, but she had to work in order to bring us here. Right. Uh, although my father was here, he didn't really necessarily want to pay for anything. So my mom had to. And 
my mother specifically said to my grandma, do not cut my daughters. But my grandma didn't listen. She thought that I was too fast and um, too energetic and just, you know, too much. So we were, because we were going to a Western country, they thought, oh my God, okay, they're gonna be tempted. So let's not make sure that they are closed so they are not tempted. Um, and then we met our mother. Uh, she found out that we had FGM, but that was the last conversation. She had an argument with my grandma and then we just never heard anything after that. I remember- Can I just stop you just there ahead. quickly? Yeah. So you see, did you tell your mum or like, how did your mum find out? My mum found out, I think, because she was giving us a shower or something. Right. And when she noticed our grandma was still there, she didn't go back because she wanted money in exchange for us. Um, she said that she's not gonna hand us over if my mom didn't come with suitcases of clothes and um, some money for her. Um, so it was almost like a transaction, which is really, really unusual. Do you um, remember your mom's reaction? My mom was shocked. I, my mom was absolutely devastated. Um, but in their mind, because of the way that they've been conditioned, she said no, and it still happened, right? So in her mind, there's not much she can do from this point forward. Mm -hmm. So it was as if, yeah, it happened. So let's just get like, on with it. Let's just get on with it now, you know? And I remember we came to Ethiopia. We stayed there for a little bit. I, again, we, me and my sister both struggled with um, our FGM. I can't speak for her. I can only speak for myself urinating um like it was just so uncomfortable to have something just shut so the the things that are supposed to naturally come out are not coming out um i don't know if <laughs> i think it's a little bit disgusting but you know what comes no, out of a vagina yeah, of yeah, you yeah, know yeah. just normal cleanliness yeah it, that wasn't happening and I remember after nine months, we left Ethiopia, we got on a plane to the UK and I had Coke for the first time. <laughs> and I, <laughs> cause my mom obviously knew what it was. Um, and my little brother knew what it was cause he was fucking juggling like g -g 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 that down. But my mom handed me a can of Coke. She opened it and it's like, it went pssst. And then in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, this this, this isn't right because water don't do this because we've right. never seen juice. Yeah, like that. Like ever in my like life. Right. I have never seen anything like it. And I put it to my mouth and I like took a sip and I remember like the bubbles and just it just didn't feel right. I'm like, why are you giving me alcohol? Right. And I literally physically screamed at my mom. I'm like, why are you giving us alcohol? You just, we just left Somalia. Yeah. Are you feeding us <laughs> yeah, alcohol? Yeah, yeah. we well, got to England already. Exactly. You're, you're like, what's going on? Westernizing me already. Ah, I was like, what? <laughs> I'm not Christian. I can't drink this. Yeah. And then my mom was dying of laughter. Yeah. And she was like, no, 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 no. This isn't alcohol. This, And I didn't believe her. Right. I genuinely thought that my mom was trying to get us drunk. We didn't even know what alcohol was, but I just thought that was it, you know? Um, so I refused to drink Coke for a very long time. But we arrived and I met my father for the first time. What was that like? It was so surreal because I remember when we came, when, when we landed and you know, the where people come out with their little signs, you know, looking for their people. My dad didn't have a sign and I, autom I knew that he was my dad. And I've never met him before, but I knew that he was, maybe because he's my lookalike, mm -hmm. but I just knew that he was my father. Um, and I automatically became a daddy's girl, but unfortunately he didn't like me very much, really? which is okay, which is okay. Why do you think that was? I don't know, maybe I looked like him. I self hate, I don't know what it is, but my father how old could was not you at stand that point? me. I was seven. How, seven how, was he, how was he towards your sister? He loved her. Right, okay. Absolutely adored his son and daughter, but the only person that actually looked like my father was me. How did that make you feel? Um, I thought I was the most hated one in my family for a very long time. I thought maybe it's the reason why, 
because as soon as I met him, a few weeks later, I remember I turned, the TV was on and it was like one of the box TVs. And I just wanted to like press it just to turn it off because I've seen people do it and I never got a chance to do it. And I was only there for maybe a few weeks. And my mom obviously got lunch ready and she said, everyone lunch is ready. So everyone went and there were bare people in the house. And I remember I was so excited because everyone left the room and I was like, oh my God, I can turn it off now. And then I went to go turn it off. And as soon as I clicked it and it went off, my, my father came and his whole entire face has changed. And he just went, but, mm. and when I told you my ear was ringing for like a good mm. three hours, I was shaking because he was so heavy handed as well. Like I landed on the other side of the, um, and I was tiny. And from that moment onwards, I it installed like a different type of fear in me when it came when it came to my father because he was very very hot tempered, but only towards me. He was never hot tempered towards anybody else. It was always me. And gradually, the I think the beatings got worse. Um, I remember I got him the wrong type of water when I was nine, maybe eight nine and he grabbed me by my neck literally lifted me up off the ground and punched me in my chest four times and my mom stopped the fifth and he said either she leaves the house or i leave the house and i could not i was trying to understand what i did wrong and my mom said my child is not leaving the house are you all right and he said well i'll show you she'll be sucking dick for five pounds in these streets by the time she's 14. So hearing that, I thought, is that why you did, like, I, FGM happened to me? Is that why you guys made sure that I was closed because you thought I was going to be a hoe? And then from then onwards, everybody will take turns in calling me a slut or a whore. My, my mother, I think, did it out of frustration. Like, it was just part of the language for her. But my father, my brothers, like, said that shit was chest. You know, I is I wouldn't. T I say that my mother. <laughs> um, I make excuses. For, I think we all do make excuses for our mothers, but when it comes to my mother, I knew for some reason that she never meant it. I could feel that she only said it just to you know cuss me because I did something. Um, but with my dad, it, it, I don't know. It just felt very. He said it with conviction. You know, he genuinely believed that I was going to grow up to be this. And age nine, I got my period, which was another traumatic experience for me. Um, I was coming down the stairs and I could feel something. And when I touched it, it was blood. And I screamed at the top of my lungs. And I was like, I'm dying, I'm dying. And then my mother rushed upstairs and took me into the toilet, showed me how to use a pad. And then she said, you're a woman now. I'm like, hold up, hold up. I thought I was a woman when I was fucking six. Mm. But, so what the fuck was that then? You know, was that just a practice? So in my mind, I'm thinking, but I thought I was already a woman. Right. I, that's all I kept thinking. I thought I was already a woman. I thought I was already a woman. But my mother said, you become a woman when you get your period. So I was like, Okay, okay, I took it. I couldn't tell anyone that I had my period, including doctors, because I struggled every single month. Almost every other month I would end up in A&E here in London. And they would, you know, check my belly because I was complaining of belly ache. I didn't put together my period, the FGM, the it was obstructing where it was coming out right right so i didn't link the the stomach pain to my period and i didn't link the period pain to fgm and because i couldn't talk about neither of it i couldn't i i couldn't even say to the doctor i i you know i'm on my period was you told that you wasn't allowed to speak about it yeah. or did you just feel like you no i was told okay i was told i couldn't talk about it so for a very long time i thought i was just the sick child the child with just the so much stomach problems and again i never thought one of the symptoms of F, um, one of the symptoms of period uh, period was you know the cramping and the, and the pain i just thought it was stomach pain my mother 
put it down as stomach pain. Right. This is how much education she had herself. Mm. She didn't say to me, oh, it's because of your period you're like this. I used to roll around on the floor because of the pain. I didn't know what to do. It wasn't coming out, you know? And when I was 14 years old, because the period was accumulating inside of me since I was nine, and there was only a little bit that's coming out at a time, it caused um, my skin to tear. And I have really sensitive skin. So the vaginal opening that was like that big was, you know, becoming a little bigger. Um, and I remember I told my mom, but I was so afraid of telling her, but the urinate, urinating, it was stinging, the period pain, it was just too much for me to handle. So I said to my mom, I'm ripping. She looked at me right in my eyes and she said, that doesn't make any sense. I have had this and many other women my age and even younger have had this and they, I have never heard of someone ripping by themselves. What did you do? I'm like, I swear to God, I didn't do anything. Like what, what could I have done? And she said, are you sure no one touched you? Are you sure you didn't like touch yourself? Are you sure you didn't have sex? And I'm like, no, because I'm, I'm terrified of having sex. How am I gonna have sex? How? If a hole like this is penetrated, I would rip open. Mm -hmm. So I, I said, you know, no, I'm a virgin. So I was taken to a doctor to confirm it. So when we went to um, the doctor, she it was a female. She was like, yeah, it's because the period had nowhere to come out. Um, so it caused your uh, her skin to rip. Sorry. So see, when you saw the doctor, the doctor then was it? Because when you went to the hospital, were they checking? No. Like, right. But when you went to the doctor, yes. did you allow them to see? Yes. My mom had to, because she wanted to confirm my virginity. Okay. So, so see when the, the doctor, see when examined. the doctor saw, mm. do you remember their reaction? Disgusted. That's, yeah. And how did that feel though? Because... <sighs> I you know, okay, the reason why I ask is because obviously you're you've gone through this experience or whatever. Then on top of that, you've been told that you can't speak about it. So you even then, so the feeling of it happening doesn't feel right. You're told to not talk about it. On top of that, which then probably doesn't feel right either because yeah. if you're everyone's supposed to be becoming a woman, then we should all be able to talk about it. Really, mm -hmm. then on top of that, now you've like having these checkups and stuff, but you're not saying anything to anyone when someone actually does see and their response is that they're disgusted <clears throat> like what does that do oh my god it hurts your soul because you can see it you know that's the first thing you see before they say anything verbally is the disgust on their face and you think to yourself automatically even as a young teenager who's well aware of uh, social standards and trends and yeah. uh, uh, you know ha you know expectations of both societies you look at that and you think i must be disgusting you know i'm i that's when i truly understood the severity of my situation when that doc doctor took a look and she's like you know almost like Ugh. but she didn't say Ugh. she might mm. as well have yeah yeah you can just um, tell by the but reaction but you can tell yeah, yeah. so she confirmed that i was a virgin i was given paracetamol she said yeah bye so i was like okay so they must not think this that bad then you know i'm at that time i'm pretty sure it was a crime here yeah. in the uk yeah, yeah. and she did nothing i could have actually had the opportunity to be opened up but that option was never given to me. They just gave you paracetamol and just left So you. I was sent home and I, I I went to Capital City Academy, CCA in Wilsdon. And I, re I remember I used to be the most judgmental woman or girl ever. Because whenever I would hear someone, oh, this person had sex, I would think because I was projecting. I'll tell you the truth. I was fucking projecting because I thought... I will never be able to ha have this experience, but this, you know, people just giving it up, you know? Yeah. And I was, I was, I was shaming people and I, because I was angry, I was fuming and I didn't know how to express myself. I could not tell my school friends that I had this done. 
because I thought I would be shamed for it. You know, or the girl without a clitoris. Like that that was one yeah. of my worst fears. Did you go to a, what see the school that you went to as well? Was it predominantly black? Was it predominantly white? Like was it mixed? It was mixed. It was mixed. I think there were more black people than there were white people. But even then Yeah, I was gonna say to you that even then quickly, did you you didn't did you have any um difficulty in school with like being a Somali girl as well? Because I say this because like in my, I went to school that was predominantly white. Yeah. And I always grew up, I had an epiphany actually as I got older, which made me feel as though, rah, like the way that Somalis were treated in my school and in my area, it made me feel like, rah, this actually must have been what it was, this must have, this <coughs> must have been what it was like for my, like my granddad when he came to this country. Do you get what I'm saying? Just yeah. being like, you know, the, like, the my the super minority and with Somalis in particular there was almost this like perpetuation of the fact that like you're black which is not cool but at least you're not Somali mm. do you get what I'm saying mm. and I was like that was heavily that was something that was heavy in my area and in my my school and stuff and like now I'm older like yeah. I understand like I mean I, that never felt right to me anyway yeah but I think like as I got older I started to think oh like you know, we all have these different struggles and stuff when, we, when we're when we going to school and that. Yeah. But um, that's probably something that isn't spoken about so much. But maybe if you went to like a mixed school or a school that was predominantly black, it may not necessarily have been like that for you, no? No, it wasn't. Um, I think everybody got along with everybody absolutely fine. I don't think anybody pointed out anything about Somalia, to be honest. Um, it was very multicultural and nobody really pointed anything like that out not that i can remember anyway but had you have talked about that that would have oh it, that my been god a yes it was yeah, yeah, oh yeah. yes it would have been <laughs> and i remember even in primary school when we had the sex education lesson i forged my mom's signature just to, so i can go um and see what it was because everyone else was doing it my sister got to do it but i wasn't allowed for some reason because in my family's head i was gonna i was the one who's most likely going to be a slut. Why? I like, don't what, what, know. Why, why, why you? Because I had a, I have a big mouth and I stood up for myself when it counted. Um, I did not allow people to push me around. I was respectful, don't get me wrong, but if wrong is wrong, then wrong was wrong. Was you, st- like in that. hindsight, was you seen as rebellious? Yes. Right. And Very. so a, re- a rebellious girl yes. is the one who's more likely to go out and be rebellious outside. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and I started when I, <laughs> so I remember they were on the screen, there was the male genitalia and the female genitalia. I was so fascinated by the female genitalia. I swear to God, I did give, I gave zero fucks about the men's. Hmm. Didn't even look at it twice because I was like, but that doesn't look like mine. Right. Why does it look like that? You know? And it, it comes back to you. Shit. This was cut. Oh my God. That was cut. I'm actually sewn together because you don't comprehend it when you're a child, especially where you live in a community that everyone accepts it. You just learn to accept it. Especially you know? like also in the class as well, you're probably hearing them say, this is that, this yeah. is this, this is, yeah. and you're like, oh, rah, like. What the fuck? <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah. I am missing all of that. Hmm. But I could not go to a teacher and say, mine doesn't look like that. Right. I don't know why. I just had to keep everything to myself because again they're white they're christian we're not supposed to interact with them we're not supposed to tell them our business our family issue is our family issue um they won't understand our culture we'll be shamed so you're conditioned not to talk about anything just keep your mouth shut just live your life you know don't complain especially if you're a woman um and then we had another sex education lesson in high school where um, they explained like the t- sexual transmitted diseases and things like this. And some of my uh, high school friends were having sex and I just wasn't with it. I felt like I was so out of place and I was, I think I was actually depressed when I was in private school thinking back, I just didn't have a name for it. I was always sad, you know, but I would put on a massive smile because that is the only time that I had any freedom in my household is when I was at school. Wait, were people having sex in primary school? 
Not in primary school. Sorry, secondary school. I was gonna say the second that time. Is the second insanity. time was right. in year. The second uh, sex education lesson, I believe, was in year nine or ten. Okay. So by then, most of uh, the school friends, or you know, just the ones that were active, you would hear about yeah, of it. Of course. And someone said to me one day, it was a boy from year seven. Funny enough, we were waiting at the bus stop, and he was like, "Are you a virgin?" And I was like, "Huh." Because I, I was maybe in year nine, ten, and he was year seven. And he was asking me if I was a virgin. And all the girls that were stood there, and some of them said yes, some of them said no. And I was so hesitant to say anything, but I thought, I'm a virgin. That's what, yeah. But I was so embarrassed to even say that. Yeah. I don't know why I was so embarrassed to say that. And then he would be, he would be like, but you're old, why are you virgin? Huh? But then I couldn't. And I just none of mad, it made kids sense. Kids say mad to me. stuff. You I was like, like, how are you so open? <laughs> kids about, say crazy yes. things. I was like, how are you so open? You're how? old. He was like, you're old. You know why? Why? Was what's wrong with you? And I was like, mm, well, <laughs> I take it. I just I was speechless. Yeah. He was so confident in the way that he was speaking so openly, and I felt so embarrassed. I felt the shame. Right. He felt no shame. Yeah, I like, he's just saying, yeah, he's saying things how he's seen it and what he believes is supposed to be and also what the, his friends and that have talked about. So he's just asking the question. 100%. Do you think the shame came from the fact that, like, you see, like, some at that age, someone asks, oh, like, are you a virgin or whatever? And you, if you have done it, you say, yeah. Some people would lie and still say, yeah, because it's, the, it's deemed as cool. And then some will just be like, no, because they actually haven't. But do you feel like your yours was that like you, you the the chances are you probably would have been a virgin anyway, maybe because you was young and whatnot. But it was the fact that like it's almost by force. Yeah. You get, does, does that yeah. make sense? Like, Absolutely. Yeah. By force, I am, and you're like there's the shame in like saying, yeah, I'm a virgin. Yeah. There's a shame in saying... Does that saying, make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I I felt like I was half of a woman. Mm. I felt like I didn't deserve that. I didn't deserve to have that experience. And then when you learning about sex education, you know that penetration takes place. So in my mind, I'm thinking, how would that even be possible if the hole that is, you know, designed for is th- that small? Mm. And we're not supposed to talk about it. So you're trying to, I knew how normal people had sex. I didn't know how people with FGM had sex. Right. Because those are two different, completely different things, you know. Um, And my young teenage mind is trying to comprehend all of this, trying to understand all of this on my own with no support at all. My mood swings were off the charts. I was... Was you heavily insecure as well? Oh my God, yes. Heavily, heavily, heavily insecure. I hated every single part of me. And I don't know why, but now people, when I speak to people that I went to high school with, they see a completely different me because I always had a smile on. I was always, you know, the bubbly and, you know, laughing and joking and I never took anything serious, too serious, you know? So... It was a it was a way to protect myself so no one knew the truth. Because if I was sad, they would know. If I cried, they would know. If I wasn't my happy usual self, they would know. So I had to. I felt like I had to keep that up. Otherwise, my whole entire world would have crumbled. And it the abuse at home was getting really bad. It affected my um, education. I believe I was. Um, I still am, I think, I, I'm not diagnosed, but I, I think I have dyslexia. I struggled with reading and writing. Bear in mind, I came to the country. I did not learn to read until I was maybe in year six, but I was barely reading. I was barely spelling. And I was new to the country. I started in year four. And we weren't speaking English at home. So how the fuck am I supposed to learn a whole new language? Plus, learning to read, learning to spell, trying to get the grammar, punctuation, all of this shit right. 
plus you have physical complications from the FGM, plus your own insecurities, plus the abuse at home, plus the expectations of both Western society mm. and the Somalian society. Right, right. And you're just, everything was just so confusing and so muddled up. I started smoking. I started rebelling even more. And it got to a point where me and my mother were not getting along. Me and my family were not getting along. Everyone continued to paint me as this whore, slut, bad breed, someone they couldn't control, someone who brought shame to them. So I just really didn't care anymore. I tried to commit, I tried to kill myself three times. Um, but I'm a pussy. So I couldn't go through with it. Um, something in me wouldn't allow me to do it. And it just, I just thought to myself, it will get better, it will get better, it will get better. And I decided to come up with this plan to go to Somalia because I knew my family wanted me to go. They just didn't know how to address that situation, how they're gonna actually get me out without me causing such a fuss. Right, because if they had come to me and said, "Oh, let's go to Somalia," I would have said, "I'm not going. Right. I'm I'm not going." They would have had to drag me to that airport, you know. Um, so it's interesting that like you've left, you've come here, home isn't home. No. Nope. But then it feels like, you know what? If home isn't going to be home here regardless of what I experienced there, I, it's probably better me going there. Yeah. Did you go Did you go back to your grandparents um, or your grandmother? I was 17 when I went back to Somalia. And at the time, I believe it was 2000, end of 2010 is when I left. And it, I didn't go to my grandma. What I really wanted to do was because I was being told all of these negative things all the time, I wanted to do, to do better. And I wanted to please my parents so bad that I literally would have done anything just to be accepted, just for one person to tell me that I'm good. That's all I wanted. So I thought instead of them dragging me to Somalia, let me say that I want to go to Somalia. So I went to my mom and I said, I really want to go to Somalia. And she was kind of taken back. I'm not going to lie. Because um, at the time there was a terrorist organization that controlled the majority of the country, Al-Shabaab. And she's like, don't go this is a really bad time. And then I was thinking if I stay, I will end up killing myself, yeah. you know? So I thought, let me leave, let me go explore my country, my land, you know, get to know my family. Biggest mistake I've ever made in my life. I wish I didn't go. Um, the culture of taking a child from a Western country back home is called Dakan Ellis, which is to reculture. So because I knew this concept already, I knew that I was going there for Dakan Ellis. Um, even though it was Dakan Ellis of my choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I just wanted them to accept me. So I thought if I get recultured, then they will accept me. I, may, I thought that was going to fix me. So when I got there, <laughs> hey, listen, the amount of shit that I saw back home is fucked. I swear to God. Go, explain. So... Three days after my arrival, um, I was at my auntie's house. Actually, it wasn't three days. I think it was like a week. Um, I was at my auntie's house. And all I hear is uh, something's happening today. It's called Tashir. And I'm thinking, what is that? So I said, I want to go. So everybody's going. I want to go. And having that Western mindset of um, wanting to know everything, wanting to just see for myself because... I couldn't understand, I couldn't, like I've seen, you know, the news talking about Al-Shabaab before, but I thought, not my people. My people don't do this. My people are smarter than this. You know, they're trying to paint my people in such a fucked up light. Um, so my auntie refused at first. She said, no, you're not going anywhere. Uh, and she explained that Tashir basically means when Al-Shabaab is um, punishing somebody for a crime. So that either means stoning to death, uh, behead, or something. Or like, ha like handcuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when I got there, I swear to you, I was in the middle of the, like it was a massive queue of women. 
and then a massive queue of men and there are little girls, little boys just running around. Everybody had to close up their shops. Everybody had to leave their houses um, and come and watch. If you didn't, you would be in trouble. My auntie said to me, no one knows, so just stay. I said, no, I want to see. So I went. I was stood in the middle, like, and there were bare people in front of me. And I remember because people were so scared, especially the women, they kept moving backwards to the, to the point where I ended up at the front. And I was stood right at the front and I could see everything and everybody. And as soon as they brought this man out, that he had a black bag over his head, they kneeled him down on the floor. And I turned to my cousin, I said, what, what are they gonna do? And she said, oh, uh, he stole something, so they're gonna cut off his hand. I said, you're lying. I said, you're lying. They're not gonna do that. She said, yeah. And she said, you might wanna like go back instead of like being at the front. And then they started chanting, you know, Allah Akbar, and I'm a Muslim. I love my faith. That was not my faith. So I refused to say Allah Akbar to someone whose crime, I don't know the reason why he stole. He could have been hungry. I don't know. He could have been wrongly convicted. I don't know. So why would I chant that? So they stretched out his hand. I think it was two men. It took two men to stretch out his hand. And another one took a machete and cut three times until it's, the hand was severed. And I froze in my spots. And my cousin said, if you don't sh chant Allahu Akbar, they all, the women had whips and the men had guns. And she said, if you don't, then they will either pistol whip you or they will whip you with the leather whip that they had. Because you'll, be, you'll almost be looked at as an op. Exactly. So I was like, okay, I, I, I started moving my mouth, but I wasn't saying, I wasn't using, I refused to use God's name in this manner. And then they bought a boiling hot um, jar of oil and they dipped the hand that they just cut. And then the guy passed out, his mother passed out, uh, other, other family members passed out. And then they dragged him back in and they took his severed hand, took the middle finger and literally waved it around and waved it right past my face. I couldn't eat for like four or five days. I could not swallow anything because all I could see was the hand. So when my uncle came to get me from my auntie's house, I thought, oh, I'm being saved. You know, I just experienced something horrific. I can go to another family member. Like this was too much. You know, I, it was nice knowing y'all. I'm gonna, you know, go with my uncle. That was again, one of the biggest <laughs> mistakes I made. I shouldn't have. Um, but when I went to another city, which was very, very far away, it was maybe three days travel. As soon as we got there, I didn't know that my uncle had an alternative motive. He already knew that I was troubled from what he heard. That an illness is only happens to those that they consider troubled, the ones that are bad breeds, the ones that can't be controlled. So he made this plan to marry me off. I was 17 when I came to him. So he waited a few months, uh, I think a month actually, um, when I turned 18 is when he started to get his plan rolling. First few weeks, he was the best uncle ever, did everything I wanted. And then gradually it was, oh, do you wanna get married? I think you should get married. You know, I think you, like, you will be so much calmer if you had a husband, you'd be you know, more respected if you were a husband. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I have been battling my own family for the smallest of respect. And now you're telling me the only way I'm gonna get respect is by marrying. And I said, I don't have any intentions of getting married. I don't have any intentions of having a husband Can or I playing the wife. i be honest with you, even at this point, yeah, whether you was thinking this or not, there must have been somewhere in your subconscious where you must have thought life is one big setup. <laughs> like this is one big scam. One minute you're <laughs> telling me that I become a woman by doing this. Then, so I, then I have that. Then I get my period and then I'm told that I've become I'm a, a woman. woman. So then I'm like, hold on, wait one second. So then what was that? 
now you're trying to find respect you're trying to do all of this type of stuff you think okay cool let me go and see if i could go back reconnect with family do the culture thing whatever else now and i'm gonna get that then you get there only to realize that the respect don't come unless no. you've got a man yep <laughs> this is absolutely. outrageous absolutely and it was a battle on its by itself because i had no parents i had no siblings i couldn't talk to anybody um because he was so fixated on me getting married i thought to, i said to myself all right at least i know one person who i know and he was a male a little bit older than me and i said can i at least marry can you at least for, like like i would rather marry him than a random person that you pick for me <coughs> i got beaten the fuck out of for suggesting that he beat me really bad uh, took my phone um and then bought my first cousin to me and introduced me as his future wife. And I said, again, I really don't want to get married. I don't think this is a good idea. I'm going to go back soon. I just kept saying, I'm going to go back soon. So there's no point in me getting married. And I didn't know, but my mother had a brain tumor. So she was easily manipulated. And I remember after the beating, he convinced my mom that I wanted this marriage and that it would be good for me. So he sat me down next to him and he called my mom and I couldn't say no. I couldn't say anything because I knew if I hung up, I, he would beat the shit out of me again. And I really didn't want to die in Somalia. Um, a few weeks later, they were still planning the marriage, even though I was still saying no. They were planning it behind my back. But I said to my mom, yes, I, 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 I chose him. I never met him, but I said it. Why? Because I did not want to get beaten the hell out of again. There's no one here to protect me. So I had to dim myself, my actual self down just to make them happy. And then I get a few weeks later, I get a call from my dad and he's like, Oh, hey, Shamsa, congratulations. You're a married woman now. I'm like, huh? I said, what? He said, yeah, congratulations. You're a married woman now. I just, yeah, just, we just had the ceremony. I just gave you up. Um, what's his name? Who's his family? What's his tribe? And I'm like, what the fuck? I was like, what? You don't know his name. You don't know the name of the man that you just married me off to. He said, no. I was, I felt, I don't know why this is making me cry today. It's not even, I've never, ever, ever cried on this part. But it, it made me feel like my whole entire teenagehood in feeling so worthless and so undervalued. He confirmed that I was worthless and undervalued. And the moment he uttered you're a married woman now all i see is women i hanged up on him i was like fuck off i didn't say fuck off but i hanged up i was i was in shock and i remember these women came put a green dress on me they did my hair and this whole entire time they were doing this it felt like i was i wasn't in my own body i felt i felt so dazed like it was so unusual it was as if it was um I'm playing a role for somebody else, almost. I, I genuinely don't know how to explain the, the shock I experienced that day. And then they put me in the back of a car. Oh my God, my makeup, I look like a ghost. Like they put the whitest foundation because they have an obsession with white skin. Yeah, of course. Um, uh, got me ready. They had like a, they put me in a car, drove me around town, beep, 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 Shams is a married woman now. <laughs> Brought me back to my uncle's house, <coughs> my grandma's house, where we were given a room. All of my furniture, the bed, the cupboards, the little TV, everything was either borrowed or secondhand. Nothing was new. But he told my mother that all the money that she was sending, the hundreds of thousands of pounds that she was sending, like in the hundreds and thousands, but like maybe a lot of money. five 
ten thousand maybe. And that's when you translate that into money over there. That's a it's, lot. That's money. a lot of fucking money. Yeah. Uh, he extorted her for money, and the most fucked up thing this man has done, apart from literally fucking up my life, is the all the gifts like the little jewelry the scarves the the dresses that i got he puts on like as debts under my name so he took like hundreds uh like a two five five hundred to a thousand pounds worth of clothes and jewelry majority which was fake and then said this debt will be paid by shamsa after the wedding you what <laughs> I don't even have money. How the fuck am I going to pay for it? <laughs> How am I going to pay for it? <laughs> you took my money. That I have nothing insanity. on my name. But th- that's what he did. So in my mind, I thought all of those gifts were actually for me. But turns out it was me paying for me. Me, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and then I was put into a room. And I remember I was facing... I did not move from where they put me. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's as if they carried me into that room and just sat me down on the bed. And right opposite, like this little, it's like a massive uh, wardrobe and he had like a little mirror in the middle. And I just remember looking at myself at age 18, thinking, Shelsa, how the fuck are you gonna get out of this? How are you gonna get out? And because of, the, because of our tradition, we have to stay in that room for seven days. And I know this. So I can't leave that room for seven days. And the intention of it is to have sex. I'm a virgin. An FGM survivor on top of that. I was sewn together. The ripping maybe opened me up that much. And prior to this, because I didn't want to get stoned to death, I had to tell them about the ripping in case he thought that I had sex. So they took me to a cutter prior to being put into the room, prior to the wedding. And the woman checked me and she said, no, she's still a virgin. Thank fuck I st- I had a Herman. Otherwise I would have been fucked mm. because some women don't have it. Mm. You know, there's not, uh, the Herman isn't proof that a woman is a virgin. Right. Some don't have it. Some have it open when they're young children, you know, because of the, the depending on their skin. <laughs> but lucky for me, mine was there. Otherwise I would not be sat here today. I would have been dead. Um, and the the fucking bitch, the cutter, she looked at me and she's like, do you want me to sew you back up? I said, bitch. I, I, okay, I didn't say bitch, but I said, no, no. I panicked, I sat up and I said, no, 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 no. And I said, why would I do that? And she goes, for your husband, hmm? Are you not supposed to open me up? Not close me more? Right. Like, w- w- what? Like, that don't make sense. Anyway. Back to being in that room, I haven't gone to, through that experience. I'm thinking, how the fuck is this going to work? No one has explained to me how sex for me works. What am I going to do? And how do I do it in order to, one, break my virginity, two, do it as painlessly as possible? There was nothing. Wouldn't it be more logical for them to say, okay, now that you're married and you're pure, yeah, we will open you up now so that you can go and do what you need to do? Uh-huh. Wouldn't that be the most logical thing to yeah. do as opposed to trying to fight that whole experience? Is that, isn't that not what happens? No, because men are like, but it's our rite of passage. No, yeah, that is not smart. So is your rite of passage to rip through me, basically? Is that, do you think, like, is that part of the pleasure for them, for some? It's power. Yeah. Okay. It's not pleasure, yeah, it's yeah. power. Is, is is knowing that there's two barriers that you have to now open. Right. But the pain that they're causing me or they're causing these women, they don't give a fuck. Mm. They give zero fucks. I, I, there's women in this country who have been ripped through because their husband said, am I not a man? Mm. You're going to go to the hospital and open yourself up. Yeah. What yeah. the fuck? To the point where some of them got a razor and tried to cut themselves at home. Just to avoid uh, having their husband rip through them, you know? (coughs) (coughs) But I did not know as an 18 year old what to do in terms of sex. I knew that I would eventually have it. I just didn't know how it would work for me. Mm. So... The anxiety though. Oh! Yo, I, I, like I said, I felt like I wasn't even in my own body. I, it felt so unusual. I felt like my brain was working 
a hundred miles per hour trying to think what am I gonna do? How can I get out? How can I escape? What can I do to stop this from happening? But no matter how big or little I thought, there was no way out of this. And then he came in, he came into the room and the way he came in, I swear to God, they need to make a movie about just this part. That's just this part. Because the way he came in was, he was, so, he felt so entitled. He came, like in Somali, they wear like a, an awis and it's a, like a cloth that they just wrap around. It's like a skirt for men. He was wearing that and a shirt. He comes in, stands right in front of the mirror that I was, you know, daydreaming on. And so I came off it. I didn't even see him come through the door. I was literally in a daze and then I find him in front of me. And the moment I make eye contact with him, he unties it and just drops it. I have never seen a man with a boner in my life. Oh, that was the first time you saw That was the first time. And I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Oh, because the, it was so unusual. How are you just walking through the door, standing in front of me and then dropping it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not even, hi, how are you? <laughs> yeah. How's your day? Congratulations, even. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, I'm your husband. Nice to meet you. Yeah, he's just coming on a vibe. He just, he just came on a... Someone told him, I think someone told him beforehand, like, just go get done, over and done with. Because that's what it seemed like. He was okay. just on it. So in my mind, I'm like, oh, fuck. Okay, he's now butt naked in front of me, waist down hard i didn't know what to do and then in my mind i'm thinking shamsa you have two choices you can either get raped tonight or you give it up and then tell him fuck off tomorrow right at least try then you know he can leave you alone so prior to whilst i was thinking that i said to him can you please help me um take these pins out of my head because i had so many again butt naked he went behind me, started taking all these pins out. And when the last pin dropped is when that thought came into my head. You had the two choices. And I chose the easier one of the two, which was give it up. Yeah. Because I was not about to fight this big man. Mm. And he was like, he was, I was skinnier than this. And he was massive. And... <coughs> <coughs> And I'm not gonna lie, I tried. And because every single position that I tried in my mind, because I wasn't letting him fucking pick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. was like, one second, let's let me do this. Let me because right, the pain, you're trying to think. All right, you're trying yeah, to think of a way that it could be easier, easier, an easier experience. Uh, yeah, whatever the word is, to get through this. Yeah, a hundred percent. But the pain was crippling, no matter how much we tried. And my guy was packing. Like, I'm Was he even... understanding? No, absolutely fucking not. There's no understanding in that fucking country. Absolutely, it's when it comes to women, there is no understanding because he came there to break the barrier. That's what he was told his manhood is, breaking me open, you know? So, when the pain became too much, I told him, like, no, like, I've had enough. And I tried to, like, move back into a position where I can control the situation. I couldn't because I was already in a compromising position and I was pinned down. I was pinned down. And when I tell you, I think... Be going through sexual assault is bad on your mental health, <laughs> your psychological well being, as well as physical. But being raped whilst you have female genital mutilation, type three, yeah, is a mad thing. Is pure cruelty. I cannot describe it as anything else. It's pure cruelty. This man pinned me down, and lit. It's like kicking open a door. Mm. That's what it felt like. Someone was kicking my body open. And it just, it ripped. Like I ripped, not a lot, but it was enough that, and do you know how, how much pressure it would have to take for your healed scar mm. tissue to be ripped open? <coughs> um, 
And then when he was done, I, I like I stopped pleading. I stopped like I I just I went into shock. My whole entire body. He caused a lot of internal damage. For out of the seven days, um, he assaulted me for four the fourth night um after he did it i said to him if you fucking touch me again i will stab you and i will happily die i will happily allow al shabab to kill me if you fucking touch me again i will fucking kill you because by then i was unable to urinate he caused so much damage that um my the urination hall i don't know what the fuck happened to it but it like i would the smallest tiny bit of urine would come out and the rest would shoot back inside of me mm -hmm. and i could feel it shooting back so i used to lay down on the dirty ass floor that only had a fucking hole in it for us to take a shit and we on but i would lay on it because i couldn't i couldn't like sit the way that they sat because i was in so much pain they refused me to get medical attention. They refused to pay for any medication. Um, and I don't know, I think he took my threat serious, um, serious enough not to touch me for the next um, three days. I think it was three days. As soon as the seven days was over, my uncle got everything he wanted, so I got kicked out of his house. So I was then homeless. So I used the money that my best friends at the time sent me in order for me to um, um, be able to afford my escape. But because I couldn't escape, I kept the money. And I used that money to rent a house. And I thought I would now at least be in control somehow because this is my house. No, because I'm a woman and I, had no, I have no control in Somalia. He, I was still expected to cook clean do his laundry and when i say do his laundry i don't mean put it in a washing machine and just wait and hang it he wanted me to bend down and physically like wash by hand and i'm allergic to the washing powder like it peels my skin i couldn't do it but every time i say no he would go back to my uncle and then my uncle would say beat her up so he would come home and then he would grab me the same way my father did pin me to a wall and beat me the first time it happened, I ran to my grandfather's house and I said, I want a fucking divorce <laughs> and I want a divorce now. Do you know what my granddad did? He laughed because nobody has ever taken me serious ever. I don't know because of the way that I speak. Um, I have like a little humor. I don't know if you can tell, even when I'm telling a story, I add humor to it because it saves my soul. You know, um, that's the only way that I know how to function. And is almost like a protective thing for me to that's how i protect myself through humor and he, he looked at me and he's like but it's okay he's your husband you know you're this you're new you guys are new to this i promise he won't ever touch you again i didn't tell them that i was still being raped as soon as i got our new house i had maybe three four days rest and then it continued um and on top of that, to be beaten, it felt like, I don't know, that they were try genuinely trying to kill me. That's, that's what I felt like, that my own family, even my ex, my husband, my so-called husband was family. He was my first cousin. <laughs> this is my auntie's son. So I'm like, my, my, throughout my whole life, it felt like my family hated my whole entire existence. Mm -hmm. My whole existence was fucking miserable. And it felt like being a woman meant being miserable and being in pain all the time. <coughs> I was told to, I have two choices. Either I will be cursed as in like, not like, you know, the curses, mm, yeah, like, yeah. curses yeah. yeah. Either I'll be cursed or I will be blessed. And apparently in their superstitious mind, if they curse me, the curse will come true. Like, if, oh, I hope you go blind or I yeah. hope you go crippled or shit like that. And I said, I don't care. I said, curse me, curse me. I would rather take the curse than d deal with, you know, what the, the, the shit that I'm dealing with behind closed doors. Anyway, I was 
told, mm, no, we can't help you. So I was ex escorted back by one of my uncles. And I remember he locked me in. So the moment he heard my voice, he was like, I ain't opening the door for you. But when he heard my uncle, he opened the door for my uncle. And right outside our, uh, my house, not his house, right outside it, there was a house that was abandoned. It was being built. And they were like massive bricks, like loose bricks. So I took one of them and I hid it. And the moment he was exposed, I because I knew that if my uncle was there, he can't touch me. I took it and I swung it as hard as I could and hit his chest. And he's like, see, I'm not the one who's abusive, it's her. She's the one who's hitting me, da, da, da. And I said, I'm hitting you, yes, because there's someone right here. Mm. I said, I would not do this in, cl in, in um, close, behind closed doors, but you do, you know? And my uncle laughed and he was like, you see, now you got your own back. You could go back into the house. I was raped that night. He sent me back just to be assaulted. And usually on a day I would be pushed and shoved with no medical attention, no help whatsoever. But the last straw for me was the worst beating I got from him. The internal damage he caused, um, the pain of the ripping and the FGM and the complications I was going through. Plus I was on my period that day. He woke me up around 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning and he said, go to the market. It is hot. And I had to wear like a full hijab on and f <sighs> like I had to drag. I was carrying the hijab more than I was carrying myself because it was so heavy and I was so tiny. And it was like maybe 20 minute walk. And I said, I can't physically, I can't physically get up. Can you please go get it and I will cook? He said, no, you go get it and you cook. So I was like, all right, you know what? Before you get beaten, just go do it. Went to the market, got my shit, and I forgot stock cubes. But luckily, my cousins, my little cousins, were coming to eat breakfast with us that day. So I put the food on, I made the tea, gave it to him, I put the food on, and I said to my cousin, here's some money, please go get the stock cube. He was going to take about 20 minutes, so I thought, let me take a nap. I take a nap, I wake up to this man on top, of, like literally sat on my chest. And the moment I opened my eye, he just went, boop, and it hit me on my face, hit me on my neck, hit me on my chest. And he's working his way down my body. And he's still on me, he's like moving down, and whilst he's moving down, he's punching me, boop, 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 boop. And then he gets off. And I'm still laid down in absolute disbelief. Like, I did not say anything to this man. He got me up and I still did what he wanted. I was in pain. And I couldn't bear to sit down for too long. And he beat me, left the ha just left the room. So I got myself uh, together and I was so full of adrenaline. Adrenaline. I can't say that word. That's oh, no, how you I know get, I'm a like, fucking yeah. immigrant. Yeah, I don't really get tongue tied like that. Adrenaline. Uh, adrenaline. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you guys don't have to take it. No way. And um, I, the, the secondhand shit that, um, because by then we moved to another property because we couldn't afford the other one. I barricaded the door with the bed, the, 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 the head, the bed's head, what's it called? The frame, mm. um, the cupboards, I put everything on. And then I stood back and I was like, what the, f how the fuck am I gonna get this, all this shit off the door? Cause I'm gonna have to leave. I barricaded myself in. And I, I didn't even know my own strength until I saw everything I own on the door mm. because I thought he was coming back to kill me. Mm. And then I thought, you know what? Fuck this shit. I don't care anymore. I really did not care that day whether I died or not. I really didn't. I took everything back out of the door. I went um, into the kitchen. He removed everything that I could use against him. All the knives, the rolling pans, um, the, the, the pan, everything that I could use as a weapon, he hid prior to even coming into that fucking room. So <coughs> the neighbors heard, they came out. Um, I told, I was screaming, I really didn't care. And then I told them, please give me your phone. And I called my mom and I said, is this what you wanted? Is this what you wanted for me? For your family to violate me, force me to get married and now for me to be beaten. And the one thing I know about my mom is she hates any man, father, brother, uncle, husband, 
ever touching um, the, her daughters. That's what her one rule, don't touch my daughters. If, if I want to beat them, I'll beat them. Right. If they did anything, come to me. Because right. she always used to say, a man's hand and a woman's hand are not the same. Mm-hmm. You know, I could, if she hits me, the pain that I would feel would be a lot less than if my dad hit me. Right. So for that reason, she did not allow any man to discipline us. Um, so she got really, really angry about the fact that I was beaten. So she said, so I gave you up for free. And I'm, re- I'm repaid by, you know, them abusing my child. And I was so scared that my mom wouldn't believe me. But lucky for me, she did. I didn't tell her about the rape um, because I wanted to say it to her face. I wanted to look her in the eye and tell her what her family has done to me. And bear in mind, I didn't know that my mom had cancer. And me and her came up with a plan for me to escape. The plan included me sucking up to this motherfucker and acting like, you know, playing the part of the devoted wife and it's okay, we'll fix things, I'm okay, I'll forgive you, I forgave you, you know, let's move on from it. And she knew that I told her that I was unwell, didn't tell her the reason. And she said, okay, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna send money to him, I'm gonna tell him to give this money to you so that you can go to the hospital. But she said, don't go to the hospital, take a bus early in the morning and because one of the girls who worked at the hospital, one of the nurses was a friend of mine. And I went to her and I said, please, if they come to you at any time, no matter what time they come, just say she just left. Then that gives me enough time whilst they're still searching for me to get out. It took maybe a, a day and a half for me to get to Mordisha because you take breaks and then there's checkpoints. I, when the morning came, I put on a massive full-on hijab, um, gloves, socks, and a niqab. I was covered from head to toe, and I was sitting on the window side of the bus. And I remember I was looking out and I was praying, please, please don't get caught, please don't let me get caught, please don't let me get caught. I I knew if I got caught, my uncle, uh, prior to all of this, at the beginning threatened that if I ever attempted to do anything, they would put my pictures in every checkpoint from there to Mogadishu. So you wouldn't be able to escape. Yeah. And also, if I do get caught, that I will be locked up by Al-Shabaab for three fucking months for being uh, bad to your parents. So I was like, okay, if I... I was not willing to get gang raped. I'm sorry for the lie. I just... I, just, I couldn't comprehend more abuse at the hands of strange men. So I prayed for my life. I sat on that bus and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And I remember the seconds before the bus was due to move, not the uncle that forced me to get married, but his brother, my other uncle, which was, he was like, he looked like Al-Shabaab, okay? But I was terrified of him because he looked like a soldier. Not that, I don't know whether he was or not, but because he, he, he wore that, the attire yeah, and yeah, he yeah, had yeah. that vibe, yeah. I just was terrified of him. And he had a really hot temper. He was worse tempered than the other one. Right. So I ain't about to find out. He walked right past the window that I was sat on. And I swear to God, I'm not going to lie to you. I am a 30-year-old woman now. I pissed myself a tiny fucking bit because of the shock. I thought, fuck, I'm going to get caught. And then from then on, I said, I started pleading to God, I will never do anything bad in my life. Please save me. Please save me. Please get me out of here. And the bus moved. And I tell you, God answered my prayers because we hardly had any stops. There weren't any proper checks. There weren't any like thieves on the road or there was just, it was just... I don't even know how to explain it. I was shitting myself, but it was like so smooth, you know? And I thought, like, God saved my life. I genuinely believe that if it wasn't for God, I would still be stuck. Um, I got to Mordisho and I get a call. I had like a tiny phone. I got a call from him. And my auntie's name is Shamsa as well. 
So the f one that I first came to when I was in Somalia, when I first came to Somalia. So she answered and, she, and he was like, is this Shamsa? And she said, yeah, because obviously her name is Shamsa, right? And he said, oh, I'm gonna, if I find you, I'm gonna lock you up. Watch what I'm gonna do to you. You will never be able to leave this country alive. Da -da 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 -da. <coughs> so to help her with the bottle. Uh-uh. Okay. Bro, I'm Somali. <laughs> He threatened me and my auntie was like, <laughs> listen, you're, you're speaking to the wrong Shamsa. This is her auntie you're talking to. He said, oh, I'm so sorry, auntie. I didn't mean to disrespect you. Sorry, that was actually rude of me. When I deep it, it's like you've gone through all of this and then the, the, there's a bottle of water and I'm with. <laughs> No, yeah, that was rude of me. What? You know what I'm saying? What? You've gone through all of this in life. Yeah. And then you was about to open up the bottle and I'm like, I'm like, oh, you should be help. No, 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 she's got I, that. No, I got this. Yeah, I yeah, got yeah. It. I got it. I got it. <laughs> Yeah, it's anyway. nice though. Right. Now I'm I'm trying As to be the will. damsel in distress. So next right. time, please open it. All right. Yeah. See, yeah. See yeah. All right. I am the strong black woman no more. Fuck but, that. Right. I'm I'm over that. I hear that strong. But um. So she was like, how about, she goes, you're talking tough now. She goes, what, why don't you come to a country, to the city that isn't controlled by Al-Shabaab? She said, come here, come here, come to this side of the world and we'll show you what this side of the family is capable of. And he was like, no, but I didn't mean it. She goes, if you ever step foot in Muqtisho, you will leave here lifeless. You will die and I'll make sure of it. Don't ever threaten my niece again and he never called me ever again wow. but even being in Mogadishu the first time I ever heard a bomb explosion was in Mogadishu the first time I saw bullets flying over people's heads was in Mogadishu the poverty the treatment of women the cases of rape underage marriage forced marriage was too much for me to handle. Even hearing those stories was too much. I had 24 antibiotic injections to deal with the pain mm. and my infection. I never had um, any physical examination in terms of the rape. It was never dealt with till now. I think I, I was told a few weeks ago that I have um, scarring on the inside um as well as the fgm cause scarring on the outside so i'm like okay so you know my community like to believe that without evidence nothing that happened to me happened to me show us okay. the evidence you know where where was where how you know how could you have gone through all of this it must be just your family but the reality is where the fuck am I gonna get evidence from? Oh, right. one second before you rape me, let me just put a camera there. Right, so, exactly. So that right. I have the evidence to show my people later so that they believe me. Coming back here, when I was on the plane back, and I remember my old, my second older brother came and got me. And, ah, oh, this part always fucks me over. But I remember, I was on the plane and prior to this, he got into a fight with me defending the man that raped me, saying that uh, it was my fault and that nothing happened to me and I was being dramatic and I just wanted to find a way out. I'm like, if I wanted to find a way out, I could have said anything else. Why the fuck would I go out of my way to make shit like this up and tell it to you? Mm. Anyway, he didn't believe a word that came out of my mouth. He threatened to beat me up as well. I was like, go ahead, because when we go back to London, I will fuck your shit up. Right. I said, touch me, go for it. Um, again, I didn't know that my mother had cancer. But so when we got on the plane, after this argument me and him had, he was so fucking cold. He looked at me and he's like, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, um, mom is dying. I said, huh? He said, yeah, mom's got um, a brain tumor. It's terminal, stage four. She's dying, just so you know. Okay, what? 
I was like, why didn't you guys not tell me sooner? And I felt something was up. I felt it. I knew that my mom would not have allowed this shit to happen if she did not have a brain tumor. Mm. Her thinking was altered. Right. She could have, she was easily manipulated. And my 100%. mom was a sharp fucking woman. Brain tumors, like, it depended <coughs> on the type of brain tumor as well. Early on, it like, it, it really affects comprehension. So you can't really comprehend things the same way. Yep. And I remember when <clears throat> I landed and I told my brother, please take me because he had a car. And I was like, please take me to my mom. He said, no, I'm jet lagged. He kept me in Somalia two weeks longer, knowing that my mom was dying. And he didn't tell me until we were on the plane. So two weeks prior to me coming, my mom was actually able to speak. So he took that from me. He could have just come, collected me. And I could have had at least two weeks or three weeks with my mom. Um, I went to, after a year and a half of not being in the country, I went to Central, the... Central, was it University Hospital? Central University Hospital, something like that. And um, I went into the room and I remember there was a woman there who was a friend of my mother's. And I, I went like this, I looked inside and all I see is this woman. And my mom was light skinned. She was complete, she was blown up. Like someone literally like put air in her like blown up and she had a thing in her throat a hole in her throat um and her eyes were going like tick, 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 uh, back foot but it was so fast like it was i knew it was something that she couldn't control but i was so confused i didn't know what the fuck was happening she didn't even look like my mom and then i left the room to get fresh air and this woman comes up to me and she points at my mother's bed. And she said, do you know why your mother's on that bed? And I said, no. I said, well, actually, yes, because of the cancer. She goes, no. She said, you put her there. And um, I said, what do you mean? And she said, a few months before my mom went into a coma, she said that she had a conversation with her where she, my mother admitted that I stressed her out so much that she developed a brain tumor. My mom never said it. My mom would never say anything like that, especially to her. Mm. She didn't like her. Mm. Why the fuck would she berate her child in front of, you know, I know mm. my mom and I knew she didn't, I knew that it didn't happen. But the shock of it, because I knew that she was now blaming me for the woman that I no longer recognize. The woman who, she can't even keep her eyes still to look at me. And I'm trying to take all of this in. And I completely broke when she said this to me. And then as soon as she went into the room, this doctor came and she thought that I was my sister. So she's like, oh, so is that your mom? Obviously I'm not gonna think twice, yeah. I was like, yeah, that is my mom. And she said, I'm really sorry to tell you, but your mom, um, has only f has has only got 48 hours to live and i was like but i was like but that can't be true i've only just come hmm. and she said you know i'm really sorry and i dropped to the floor i don't even know how i got home that day came back the next day and there were two women with my mom none of which i recognized but I didn't care. I just really wanted because I knew my mom was dying and the doctor said 24 hours, 48 hours. I knew that I had limited time to tell her that I'm here and I'm safe. So I sat next to her and I kept telling her, you know, when just before a Muslim person dies, um, we believe that they should say the Shahada. Um, that kind of guarantees them paradise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And... Um, I kept saying to her, please don't forget to say the Shahada. So I kept repeating it over and over and over again. And I kept telling her how much I love her and how sorry I am. 
and for her to forgive me. And I kept telling her that I promise you I'm good. Like I'm a good person. And I'll prove it to you. And um, I, and then I kept repeating, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I'm here, I'm in the UK, I'm safe. And then her eyes stopped. And she looked directly at me. And she started crying. Like full on tears and then I thought I felt so guilty because yesterday someone told me that I caused her death or I caused her to be in this condition so I thought to myself now you're making your mom cry on her deathbed which I thought was really unfair so I got up and before I got up these women like literally ran to my side of the bed and they looked at my mom looking at me and they were like oh my gosh her eyes stopped oh my god her eyes stopped and she, and then because because of them my mom got distracted and then her eyes went back again and then they wouldn't stop but she, you could see the tears mm -hmm. flowing and then this bitch of a woman turned around to me and she's like do it again I don't know what you did to make her eyes stop but do it again and I said to her I'm not here to do magic tricks mm -hmm. I didn't even know that my mom was going to do that but all I wanted was for her to know that the person she fought so hard to bring back to this country before she died is here and I wanted her to die peacefully knowing that all her family all of her children are here together so her recognizing me, even though I could have had enough, I could have had more time with her, which was taken from me. But just knowing that she recognized me and she knew that I was there. You had a powerful, powerful it, bonding moment. A powerful it bonding was, moment. You know what? They wanted, that woman wanted you to do that again because they didn't have that. You had something that is like super, super, super special. And you know what? Like... Hearing you speak, obviously I never met your mum and I'm hearing your story for the first time yet, but I, I'm going to take a big educated guess in knowing that, like, you apologising to your mum, your mum may not have accepted the apology. Do you know why? Because you didn't do nothing wrong. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. You didn't ask to be put in any of those situations. You know, you are in somewhat a victim of circumstance and tradition and culture or whatever it may be. Um... But it wasn't your fault. And your mum, like, even from the get-go, your mum didn't even want you to be a part of a certain element of it. She she did her best to, to well, maybe at that time to try to protect you from it or whatever and thought that maybe it was better for you to be there and whatnot. But, like, you know, it just didn't work out in the way that maybe she ideally would have liked it to work yeah. out. But either way... You did nothing wrong. You did nothing wrong. And that, that see that, even though you didn't get the two the two weeks with your mum, which is super unfortunate, yeah, there's something, honestly, so special about being there in those type of moments and for things like, and for something like that to happen. And that will stay with you forever. Absolutely. And I, and I think, um, how long ago did this happen? Um, 2012. 2012. It's like, it never gets any easier. But I think that like, as time goes on, it's like it becomes a, one of those things that kind of keeps you warm when you when you get cold. Do you get what I'm saying? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, what I didn't know was that even. Do you know why my brother came and got me? Because my mom said to him, "If you don't," she asked before she went into her first coma she asked every member of my family to go and get me she said please go get my child they all said no she's better off there because they knew she was dying none of them wanted me here mm. so she said to my brother ultimately i will curse you on my deathbed otherwise go get my child mm. i don't need you to look after her she will look after herself go and get her whatever she does just go and get her and everybody else was telling me this, not my siblings. So my mom had to fight on her deathbed to get me back. 
And I remember distinctively having a conversation with her whilst I was still in Somalia because I felt like something was up, something was wrong. And I refused to eat for three days because I wanted to speak to my mom. And she called me and my auntie said, you know, she's not eating, she's being silly, you need to speak to your child before she starves to death. And then my mom, again, not knowing at the time, she said to me, Shamsa, I need to tell you something. She said, I don't know why you're so worried, I'm supposed to be the parent. So I was like, I know. But she's like, I'm supposed to be worried because you're the one who's, you know, having bullets flying over your head and you're in that country. I'm safe. You don't need to worry about me. But she said, you need to listen to me very carefully. So I said, okay. And I genuinely thought it was one of those moments where parents were just, you know, giving advice to their child. So she said to me, Shamsa, if I die in this country, whilst you are over there, I want you to know that you're gonna die there too. Because not one member of your family will look back at you. So she said, if you come back, I want you to prove to them that you are a good person. And make something of yourself so that you don't have to depend on them. Mm -hmm. Because if you do come back, they will turn their back so you, you will not have anyone. And this is around the time that she was fighting to get me back. So, as soon as I came back to the UK and my mother passed away, everyone said that Shamsa, she was waiting for you. hundred, a hundred million percent. I had seven days with her. I came on the 1st of February and she died on the 7th. And you had a special bonding moment with her. And I had that one amazing mm -hmm. moment where my heart was calm knowing that my mom knew that I was there and I was safe and mm -hmm. I was okay. And, you know, that I'm here, you know, you don't have to worry about me anymore. And being a mom, I can't imagine being a mom now. I can't imagine the worry that she went through even on her deathbed, about her child. And then once my mom was gone, I had no one. Mm. And everything that happened to me in Somalia is as if it disappeared. Yeah, as if it didn't It's happen. as if it didn't matter yeah. anymore. Yeah. How have you, like, w worked through the trauma of, like, what you've gone through? Like, what have you done? <laughs> have you... Have you um, like had therapy? Like, have you got friends that you speak to? Have you like <laughs> what have you done for yourself? Uh, my therapy for a very long time was talking, telling strangers that I I will never meet again my whole entire life story, and I would move on because then I wouldn't be ashamed to tell someone who didn't know me. But I was ashamed to tell people that did know me because I knew they wouldn't believe me. Mm. So I'm not gonna lie to you, I did not start my healing journey until I was 28. That was what, two, three years ago. Wow. And I was one of the most negative people. I, live, I lived in Brent, in London. Um, they told me that I made myself intentionally homeless by not being in the country. And my own sister took me out of the tenancy agreement because she could not imagine living with me. And I was ultimately blamed for my mother's death. Everybody blamed me, told me that if I hadn't called her to tell her that I was being beaten, then she wouldn't have had, her blood pressure wouldn't have gone up, her sugar levels wouldn't have gone up. And then she wouldn't have found out that she had cancer. She needed to know. She needed she, how to do know. You, how do you how do you feel about that now? Even though that is something that people have tried to drum into your head, how do you feel about that? I know that's not true. Right. I absolutely know. But this is what I mean. People have been trying to crush my spirit for so long since I could remember. They tried so many ways to crush my spirit by blaming me for my mother's death, mm -hmm. by not acknowledging what happened to me in Somalia 
by calling me a liar, mm -hmm. by degrading me, by basically as a sibling, as a daughter to a father, I meant nothing. So it was really, really tough to look at myself in the mirror and see a good person. I thought all of these people can't be lying. There must be some truth to what they are saying. Maybe I'm just, I think I'm a good person, but maybe I'm not as good as I think I am. But the truth is, I am the kindest person I have ever met in my life. I would do anything for anyone. I would absolutely do anything for everyone. Everyone but myself. Yeah. <laughs> I but put yeah, everybody first. Right, but obviously it is naturally it really important to do things for yourself because you can't even be you can't even be fully helpful to other people if absolutely. you're not helpful to yourself. It took that me a very so, long time so to learn that. To... It took me a very long time. And even down to education where I thought I was dumb and uh, people were like, you're not book smart and all of mm. this. I just finished university. Okay, see I there. went just so that I could see if I was good or not. Right. And it turned out I'm actually really good. Yes. I am able, but because I gave myself peace, mm. because I moved out of the environment that was causing me so much discomfort. London is where I experienced the majority of my uh, horrible experiences. Mm. The family drama, where my mom's buried, it was too much, it was too heavy on my heart. So I migrated. You know, in Islam we believe if you've ex had bad experiences in a place or if you've committed a crime in one place, if you migrate, then your, as a criminal, your sins will be forgiven. Mm -hmm. And if you migrate as someone, you're running away from, you know, abuse or, you know, um, traumatic experiences, you're starting brand new somewhere else. Right. So that's what I decided to do. Not without making bad decisions on the way. Naturally. <laughs> naturally. Uh, you can't get everything right. Cl cl clubbing and partying, drinking yeah, was man. one of them. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes you've got, do you know what? I'll be honest with you. Sometimes you just got to do that to learn something about yourself, even if it's a harsh reality. You get 100%, what I'm saying? A hundred percent. All of that is part of growth, isn't it? I think. I mean, some people may not necessarily need to go through that, but I I do. I mean, I, I've had to. I mean, I, look, a part of that club stuff and whatever is, <laughs> you know, is what, like, is a part of my life, isn't it? Yeah. But I do it in a different way to how I did it before, but it's just kind of the same with women or whatever else. Like, I needed to do certain things for me to understand a little bit more. And get it out of myself. your system too. 100%. Because you wouldn't see me in a fucking club at this fucking age. <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with a 30 year old going clubbing, but it's just not well, I'm the not same lie. vibes. If you like r and I'll do a really good R&B party, but we'll do it. Yeah, about like that I don't time. mind like, <laughs> like, like small parties, but yeah, as in like yeah. big clubs and yeah. doing the pre-drinking and then go, I, I can't do that anymore. Maybe it's because I'm a mom now. Yeah, I hear you. But it's a bit too much. But one of the things that helped me get over my trauma is one, forgiving. Right. As fucked up as that sounds, um, there was a lecture I watched and the man was, I felt like he was shouting at me. <laughs> and I remember he said, how come we're all sinners? And he said, how could you stand in front of God and say, God have mercy on me and forgive me for my sins when you could not show the same mercy and forgiveness to your fellow humans? And he said, no matter what crime that person committed against you, it is not for you to punish. Not, not, not like you can get justice, but you can't physically like stab him or kill him or, you know, harm that person. So it was so powerful it, to me anyway, it really resonated with me. And I thought, okay, bitch, like you sin too. It might not be as bad as his, mm -hmm. but I would want my sins to be forgiven. I want to stand in front of God and be able to say, forgive me and have mercy on me. And knowing that I will get that mercy and forgiveness because I showed the same mercy and forgiveness to my fellow. Mm. I don't necessarily forgive the what they did to me, but I will leave it to God. I forgave on this planet, 
on this life, in this life, and on this in this body, this soul, forgave in this temporary life. But in the hereafter, that is for God <laughs> to mm. forgive or not forgive. I, I can't do anything. Right. I can't even get the justice that I deserve because he's in Somalia. Right. So there is no point in me dragging myself through the mud mm -hmm. for years because what I'm asking myself, why did this happen to me? I already know why. Because of money, because of greed, because of hatred that people had for me, because of the misunderstanding uh, they had of me, the, pay the, you know, the image that they um, painted of me. So I forgave for myself, for my soul and for my spirit so that I can raise my child without carrying all of this resentment and you know hatred and all of it's just i already have enough baggage i don't mm. need resentment fear more and more insecurities than i already have you know and i think what one of the things that was really powerful for me is i used my voice i tried to find an example of somebody similar age a black woman who went through similar experiences to me I could not find one. I could not find one person to relate to. And it broke me and I thought, but what's stopping you from being that person for somebody else? If there's nobody out there that is talking about this within your community, then maybe you, you have this voice, big voice that you've always had for a reason. My family don't respect me. So who's there to shame me? You mm. can't shame me more than I've already been shamed, you know? So ever since I released this life experiences and the world, it has now, you know, it's not just my secret anymore. Mm. It's the world's problem. Right. You know, it's not just a me issue. It's y'all all are fucking sharing this with me. You guys will hear this story. It will trigger you, but you might learn a thing or two. You know, maybe the first oh, lesson could be don't fucking go to Somalia. <laughs> No, you I want to go. I want to go though. You want to go, man. You're fine. No, no, you're no. fine. You're chilling. <laughs> you're chilling. They will welcome you with open arms. I'm just but writing down one of your quotes. Sorry. Being a woman is by far the most toughest thing ever. And now in the world that we live, where you hear, oh, a woman is this and a woman is that, I will never take the definition of a woman from any fucking body ever again. I became a woman four fucking times. Like, I hear that still. But, like, come on. I hear that. I had a child. You're, you're a woman now. Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. fuck you all of you all these... <laughs> and your definition of what a woman is. Yeah. Because from my experience, being a woman is is pain. Yeah. You know? You, you was told this from year six. I mean, from the age the of age six. The age of six. And then multiple times afterwards. Talk to me about the work that you're doing now. <sighs> Oh, the work I do now fulfills me. And I think it's one of the things that accelerated my healing process. Um, so I do a lot of public speaking. Um, I train Met Police on honor-based crime and FGM. Um, so far, I think I've, it's been just under a thousand or a thousand officers, new recruits. Um, the border control, I'll be training them next month. Um, medical professionals, teachers, social services, um, as well as talking to survivors and helping them understand that we need to detach shame and FGM because a crime, you shouldn't be ashamed of a crime. Is it something that was committed against you? Wow. So why should you be ashamed of it? Mm -hmm. Why should you live with the complications for so long to the point where you've delayed speaking and seeking help and you get to an age where, I don't know, you might become infertile. Uh, it might, you might be in labor and you could risk both your life and the life of your child because mm. you didn't speak sooner. Mm. You could risk having a really bad infection, you know, because you're being ripped open. I want them to understand that talking about sex, talking about your vagina, talking about what is missing, what isn't missing, how it makes you feel, isn't something you should be ashamed of. I live and breathe for survivors. Most people focus on the practice of FGM, but we are the practice and the practice is us, is the women.
you know, is those, is those commu practicing communities, both those men and women. So education is huge and it makes such a massive difference. And lucky for me, people really do resonate with the way that I choose to educate and the way that I express myself and the, how open I am about everything. You know, I am happy to describe how my vagina looks, whether you are disgusted by it or not. I really don't give a fly fuck, you know? It is not for me to, I don't know, help you make sense of my body. It is mine. Too much has happened to it already for it to feel any type of shame. So, and it, that helps a lot of other survivors as well because they think, oh, if she can do it, if she can speak about it, so can I. If she can, you know, uh, if she can want help and try to seek that help and try to get, I don't know, reconstructed surgery or, you know, the different possibilities, they now have a person they can come to and say, okay, this has happened to me. You know, I'm insecure about my body or I'm insecure about sex or I am I have fears about this and that. And I'm able to have a conversation with them. I'm able to tell them it's okay. Right. You know, your feelings are valid. What do you think that we could do to help you? Not just specifically me, but like, what do you, f is there anything that you feel that you need help with? Um... I think the only thing I can say I need help with is more awareness and education and that's exactly what you're doing right now. By just having me on or having somebody else who's experienced it or even sharing, I don't know whether it's a podcast or whether it's a video about FGM, sharing that with you know your inner circle or your family members or you know it could actually help save somebody's life and you might not even know it mm. because there is such lack in education and majority of these survivors don't have access to i don't know these videos they've never known it, it ever existed so i want there to be as much awareness and accessibility for education for survivors and for the wider communities mm. You know, I was listening to this and I was thinking to myself, like, it almost reinforces, some people don't agree with this, but I, for me, it just reinforces this. But I always feel like there's so much power in the privilege doing the speaking as well. Yeah. And the example that I always give is like football, for example. So, you know, you have the, the players on the pitch, the black players that are getting the you know being a oh, monkey this that and whatever racism yeah. the black is crazy. the black players can walk off and that's cool but you know what would make the biggest difference if the mm. white players said you know what nah fuck you I'm yeah i'm walking that. off too i'm not having that mm -hmm. and i think in this in this scenario because and also it f affects the money which is mm. what the thing that can would really make them want to do something yep. but i think it's also the same in a situation like this women can speak from the rooftops about this ain't right like they're cutting this off and doing that and whatever and yeah. this this way of doing this circumcision stuff is 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 morally wrong but you know what do you know where the power is is if like men kind of stood up and was like hold on wait what is this nah and i think th the more that that happened the more that men that were a part of that or like in this mindset of purity yeah um would then turn around and think okay maybe you know what even if it even if in in their heart or even if in their minds they believe that this is the right thing to do they will not be so quick to do it because they will be shamed mm. to do it yeah. do you know what i'm saying yeah. and then the shame ultimately can reverse an element of that tradition because then you're like you know what you get to a point where it's like this is something at one point that we once did yeah. as opposed to it being a thing that you're still doing you 100%. get what I'm saying 100% and men, I hope that at some point that does get reversed men have a massive part to play in this 98% of Somali women are circumcised how much? 98% Sierra Leone I think it's 80 something percent is that in country? In country, it's not diaspora. I, yeah, majority in of Somalis, babe. All, all. Yeah, majority of them. There is maybe 
two three percent that are not it's very rare to um for a somali woman not to be they if they might not have the severe one that i have yeah, yeah. it's like the, but different they types, would yeah there's yeah. different there's types a, yeah. so they might have the less severe yeah. type in their opinion um but again it's something that they will never speak about and share and i want them to be able to do that openly without mm. any shame but think about it 98 percent of somali women are cards where are 98 percent of their fathers mm. 98 percent of their brothers because realistically if a man was to put his foot down and say i don't give a fuck you're not cutting my daughter then sure. the daughter wouldn't be cut That's do you know happening. how many girls have been saved because of their fathers right. the man is the one that everybody listens to the man is the one that everybody respects not the mother but men are saying oh this is a woman's issue we don't want to get involved really yeah nah so but then like... when your daughter bleeds to death then you just bury her onto the next one nah i think it's not we can't it's impossible for it to be a woman's issue anyway it's impossible to use that it's impossible to use that argument when you use the word purify because mm. the word that purif that purification is coming down to sex and relationship and marriage and whatever in which obviously in the culture you believe in <coughs> uh heterosexual Hetero. Hetero, heterosexual sex mm. which is man and woman mm. so so yeah like you can never use that as a as it's just a woman's issue it's not it's, it, it's it's heavily men as well and obviously i'm a i'm a like i'm a you know i mean i'm a pro man i'm not dismantling you yeah, know what i'm yeah, saying yeah. but what is right is right and what is wrong is wrong and i 100%. think and i just think that like you know we should be looking out for each other as best as possible and you know, I've got, there's uh, there's so much thing. Can you know, we could do another. Let me ask you a question. Where are you from? I'm Jamaican. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, I was about to. I, I thought I don't know why, but in my mind, I thought maybe he could be Nigerian because majority of Nigerians don't. Not majority, but some of them seem to be oblivious to the fact that it happens in Nigeria as well. Yeah. No. And Ghana. No, and no. Gambia. Like when I say Africa, yo, there's a lot of countries that are because it's the, the the misconception likely might be that it's like more Eastern Africa, right? Mm. Yeah, but it's yeah. not. But it's not. It it happens in North. It happens in um, East. It happens in the West. It happens in almost almost the majority of African countries. Almost. There some are some exceptions, but even those exceptions, they used to have it, say, you know, a few years ago or centuries ago, or they banned it or they don't do it anymore, as they claim. But if one girl is being cut in the continent of Africa, bitch, this is, an, this is a whole Africa problem. Mm. What it's an, madness. What? It's madness out here. And on top of that, I deal with cases of reculturing. So do you know how I told you Nakan Ellis is reculturing? So there are girls and boys, teenagers and um, young youths, even adults who are being manipulated into going to Somalia. They have guns pointed at them the moment they enter the airport. They have their passports forcefully taken from them. If you're a boy, they are, you're locked up in a facility where you are chained on a daily basis. You are beaten on a daily basis. You can never escape. Um, some are forced to get married. The girls are sexually uh, assaulted in these spaces, these reculturing facilities. Um, and the British government do not know what the fuck to do about it. So why? Because it's black, black people, black boys, black girls. They don't know what to do. How are the, both parents in this country and the children are there by themselves without a passport? Yeah, that is outrageous. That makes no sense. I have now brought back three two minus one boy one girl one 18 year old boy who was taken when he was 15 and he was locked up until he turned 18. i actually rest took him from uh, the place that he's he was in got him to run away to a safe house mm. a few weeks ago i was dealing with a mother and daughter 
the mother is a British born citizen. She has FGM, she was forced to get married and has a child now as a product of that forced marriage. They don't know how to bring any of them back. I was like, what? So I have to physically fight the government to bring these people back because one 23 year old British girl was murdered and another one is missing was missing she got uh, she got back in contact with me oh. a few days ago wow so even this government are, are failing mm. these children who are being trafficked out of the country being left to be assaulted beaten and they get an fgm done on them the girls the boys are being tormented and can you imagine what they'll do when they come back They're, they'll hit the streets Oh, well, they'll yeah. be the first ones to carry the knives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because obviously now nah, you're that's all they're carrying trauma. Of course, and, and they then are. and then after that, when you come back here now, you're just projecting. Yeah, the I same way that you kind of did, where it was like you were just angry at you're everything. You're a hoe. You're yeah. a hoe. You you ain't yeah. right. This ain't yeah. right. Yeah, I was projecting. Mm. And these young men, you know what? What makes me really sad is there's so much help for young girls out here. I'm not gonna lie to you. There are millions of pounds being put into organizations just to help you girls but there and isn't women. For the boys. There is nothing yeah, yeah. for young black men who mm. face honor based uh, uh, abuse. And when I say honor based, like bringing shame to a family member, anything to do with shame, mm. you know? And that's a problem because it's just like, again, we as men are already made to feel as though. You have to just be tough and get on with it. Do you get what I'm saying? That's so what then you now to add to the fact that you've had to go through all of this stuff and then you just got to get on with it. Like, that's a mad thing to just... And then, nah, like... Mad. Ah, bro, and 80, the 80-year-old 80 boy, do you know what he said to me? He's like, Sham, I know men are not supposed to cry, but I actually cried. Yeah. And I said to him, what the fuck? I said, what the fuck do you mean? Men are not supposed to cry. You're not human. Mm. He goes, no, because men are uh, like, if you if, if a man cries, he's seen as yeah, like a pussy. a pussy. Yeah. And then in my, I'm, it broke my heart, mm. especially knowing everything that he went through, being mm. chained, being locked up by his own family members. So he's lost trust in authority. He's lost trust in family. And some people might say, oh, Shamsa, why do you help men then when you were violated by uh, men? Because one, a victim is a victim. These ones are not the ones who violated me. And second, I don't want them to lose faith in a Somali woman. I do not want these young men to lose faith in Somali women. They've lost faith in their mother, in their sisters, in their aunties, the grandparents. So why should they lose faith in me? Yeah. And, and then who are they going to marry? Somali exactly. women. Who are they going to brutalize? Somali fucking women. Also as well, you know what? It's like, there's the element of penetrating the the mindset of, or what that, that person could potentially think. Because mm. you know what? If ultimately, yeah, this person could actually one day be the privileged person who could say something about what is right and what is wrong. Yeah. So it is important to get them to understand certain things from early, to understand mm. Their, their culture themselves what what is morally right what is co what is correct you know um probably the best way the best ways to move within themselves to build family to to rate how you uh regulate your emotions and you know what i mean like it's actually all right to be emotional all these type of things and also these are the things that women are going for whatever so that when that person or that that young man or that young boy becomes a man his mindset in what he believes yeah. is right and wrong more aligns to what the comfortability of not just his family but just culture in general do you get mm -hmm. me absolutely you can't have pe people walking around going through all of these type of things all to to this day it's, it's insanity yeah it's, it's madness but i hope yeah, that somali so men and all black men because it's not just happening to the somali community no, there are course. people who are being taken to the Cong congo yeah. there are people who are being taken back to nigeria and left behind yeah there are people being taken to Pakistan we call it, we call it getting left dipped. behind we call it getting dipped there you people go getting everyone dipped. every yeah. culture has a fucking name for it yeah, yeah. but why are we allowing it why are we our parents are traumatized i'm mm. sorry but they Absolutely. have gone through a lot yeah, yeah and their minds will never change they are programmed to stay that way so it's about breaking that 
And it's, it's about, about obviously breaking reversing. Actually, no, you can't break it. Not with for them, you can't. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for them, exactly. Yeah, there I didn't mean it for no them. There's no way you can. Yeah, help I didn't them. mean it. I didn't mean it for them. Yeah, uh-huh. no, no, for I mean, us. For, uh, anyone right. younger, exactly. Like maybe forty and under. That's exactly what I mean. Would actually genuinely have like maybe a different mindset. Yeah. Above that, you uh, can't. That's we it. just have to wait for them to die. die like, exactly. God bless you. Exactly. Like you've done, you've done your thing. Exactly. Thank you. But bye. But now I'm worried about my generation and the older generation. Are you guys gonna keep? Are you gonna ca- carry on? Are we going to continue it, or are we going to begin to heal as men, as, as women, and respect each other? Because this war between oh, uh, this what's it called? The fucking every ma- oh. <laughs> some men give them a microphone and goddamn. Oh. I said to God, not you, not you, you're good, you're good, you're good. <laughs> you have a purpose. <laughs> but like the trashing, yeah. you know, all this the uh, privilege and what was called feminism and oh, yeah. um, women thinking that it's okay to, you know, disrespect men and say, you know, you have to do this and do this and do this and do this and we can't, we don't want to do this and do. Listen, if I am in love with somebody, or if a man is in love with somebody, he would do everything he can for that woman. Thanks. If I am married to a man and he is doing everything for me, then I would worship, okay, I wouldn't worship, I worship God, mm. but I would worship the ground he walks on. Like, yeah. I, like not literally, but you know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with that. I think and people I would just do make anything it seem for like him. This. People make it, people just But go, then they, well, I don't understand why people make it seem like the man has to do everything or the woman has to do everything or, like, come on, where you guys are in love, you would do you would do anything do you know and everything for your man and your woman. You know what? Like, let's like, not lie. A lot of the time, people just go on a microphone and they just say a bunch of stuff. But you see, in their actual reality, it doesn't equate. Because the but moment that they the meet somebody girls, that they I... love, all of that stuff that they spew, it doesn't connect. It doesn't, it's just not, they're not doing that. And then what ends up happening is, you know what? I'll tell you what ends up happening. They go on the microphone and they start saying all of these things. Oh, you, we need to be doing this and all men and that, all mm. men are this and all women are this and all women, are, this all happens amongst everyone, yeah? Mm-hmm. And then, Absolutely. one day, the small minority that have done this end up really falling in love with somebody, yeah? And then, maybe later on down the line, they'll come back and they'll reverse some of the things that they said, but it's like, you spent you years, mm. yeah, get going into people's minds, telling yeah. them this, that and the fourth and whatnot, only to... Like years later, you've changed your mind in that. And then you can just sit there and have the safety blanket of saying, yeah, but I changed my mind. Yeah, but look at all the damage that you did by being on the microphone chatting shit. <coughs> you, like sometimes, realize. sometimes the idea of people just saying, I changed my mind pisses me off. Because yes, you are allowed to change your mind. But look at what you did in the process of doing that. You've you better spend so that same people. energy mm-hmm. while you, as you've Sit. changed your mind, spend that same energy fixing, that fixing it while you, you understand what I'm Absolutely. saying? So there's going to be a lot of that anyway. I but, hope so. But listen, I really hope so. F- like this was the, easily, <laughs> this is easily the most powerful conversation. Well, you had to say I've that. Ever, no, I, I promise you. <laughs> I, this is the most powerful conversation oh. I've ever had on the pod. Like, I'm so grateful that you came. Um, I'm honored. And, and I hope, I'm sure this is going to resonate with a lot of people and stuff like that. But like, there's so much more things I want to talk to you about, but we can do it another day because there are things that are like, aside from it, like, for example, I've wrote in my notes, like, culture versus religion versus tradition. I think mm. there's like a conversation all in that. That is but, an amazing um, conversation to have for sure. But look, like, honestly, thank you. Like, thank you. And and I'm also happy to hear about the Bro, work that I you're doing. Bro, I used to watch you, okay? Is it, yeah? What are you, and what's the, what's the other one? Poet and Dan. Oh, what's the other one? Who? He's got longer hair. Poet? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I used to think, like, every time I see a black man or a black woman, you know, having a space, it brings me so much joy, mm. especially when they're not using that space for... Right you know, complete fuckery. Like, you know, it's nice to have fun here and there, but also to have, you know, nice, you know, conversations where you can learn a thing or two. Um, But I've always been a fan. So even being here, I'm so honored. Thank you for having me. And thank you for picking this topic because it would mean so much to the 60,000 women in the UK who are currently going through this, if not more. Thank so. you.
thanks for listening everyone yeah thank you Love.